Lights are on. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, members of the board. For the record, I'm Tom Reedy, an attorney with Bacon Wilson here in Amherst here on behalf of 462 Maine in its application for a modification of the site plan as the chairwoman mentioned. With me this evening, to my right, is the manager and, and member of 462 Maine, John Robleski. Uh, we also have our civil designer, Bill Osley, and our architect, Christine Royal. Um, so as the chairwoman mentioned, um, we've got some changes. We were here and we received approval August 27th. It was for a mixed-use building with 16 units uh, and 30 beds, 32 parking spaces. Um, so in the interim, John um, had some time on his hands, looked at, at some of the other projects that were being approved, look at, looked at the market, and thought, how can I um, hit that market better? Um, and how can I make the site better? How can I give it more amenities? And so that's really what he's done. And so he's increased uh, the units by eight, but I think the, the notable piece is increase the bedrooms by five. And so what he's done is really changed some of those units. He was approved for four one bedroom, 10 two bedroom, and two three bedroom. And he is requesting approval for four studios, 10 one bedroom, nine two bedroom, and one three bedroom. And so there's a shift um, to studios and one bedrooms because I think probably what the, what the board is seeing, I know what I'm seeing in town, is that there's a, a push for more um, single bedroom units, whether they're in the form of studios or one bedrooms. I think you had the project down on Southeast Street show that. I think you've seen from Archipelago downtown. Um, I think just anecdotally talking to a lot of the different landlords in town, that, that's what they're seeing. So, so John has seen that and, and wants to modify this design. I think you'll see tonight that the architecture is very similar. Um, the footprint has only increased by 800 square feet. Uh, gross floor area has increased by 2,700 square feet. And then I think he's made some other changes to the site that he'll go over in a minute um, that have increased utility, uh, provided additional amenities, you know, covered bike storage area, indoor trash. Um, and then there's a, there's a shift of the ADA spaces to make them more accessible. I think they make more sense where they are now. And then a relocation of the transformer and then um, the electric vehicle charging stations to, stations to be in close proximity to that transformer. Uh, so with that, um, what I'll do is I'll turn it over to, to John uh, to talk through the changes. And, and what we've got is uh, an overlay uh, and I can always toggle. I've got the approved plans uh, from before, and I've got the proposed plan, so I can always toggle back and forth, forth if you need it. But without further ado, John Robleski. Thank you. Good to see you all again. Happy New Year. So this is an overlay of the old and the new. So the lighter colors of the building are the approved plan from August. On the darker shaded kind of rust colored are the additions to the footprint of the building. So this area here is two feet by 56 feet. This is about six feet by 56 feet. Uh, this area here is about 10 and a half by 14. And then this area is seven by 56, I believe. The office area stayed the same, that's 22 by 25, so the 550 square foot office area remains the same. Um, the light gray parking area is the new layout. I think John. Yeah, if you bring it back down. So the upper part of the parking area hasn't changed at all. Uh, what we did, the existing barn that's there that is this light colored square, 20 by 20. Um, that is in close proximity to that tree there and there's already pavement, that dotted line is the current pavement. So we thought it best to move the uh, island further south to allow that tree's roots to have more space rather than underneath the blacktop like it is now. So in doing that we reduced this to three parking spaces where the old one um, there was four parking spaces there. There was one, two, the two handicap, or maybe just three. 
But anyways, that allowed us to get a little more room in this area for the covered bike storage, which would be like a shed roof coming off of the, the back of the building there, and to redo that back section of the existing structure. And just to add 32 square feet right in this area here to allow a little more room for trash cans right in that area inside and allow interior bike storage for the winter on the back half of that. So this back section here would be interior bike trash recycling here. But if you remember the previous plan, which is this kind of dark line for the parking, how tight this was here, that always kind of bothered me. And I'd rather have more green space there for the tenants to enjoy and make it more like a, a residential property rather than have blacktop, you know, all the way through here. So in doing that, we were able to uh, do away with five parking spaces there. We gained one up here, one up here by re redoing the uh, handicap. The handicap got moved to the center of this backside. So there was, we gained two spaces back there and we added three up front here. You can go back down. So these three new spaces up front here are three compact spaces and, and dealing with the Eversource and the location of the transformer and the EV charging stations, they want the charging stations in close proximity to the uh, transformer. <clears throat> so just kind of helped out in both directions with that. Uh, this handicap van space here is better in that location that gives direct access to the office area, which is apt to have the most handicap going in there. And these spaces pretty much stayed the same. You can see the light gray, we actually pushed it back, I think about two and a half, three feet here. Stormwater area is still in the same area. Um, there's a, like a preceptor catch basin type thing right here. So we tried to get the transformer on that side versus where it is over here. But this transformer where it is there, the whole front of the house kind of slopes up from the street, if you remember. And this section in front of the porch where the tall shrubs are actually is about two feet higher than the edge of the pavement here. So what we're doing is we're dropping this grade down to about 92 and a half here. 93 on the corner, and the transformer will be at 93, which kind of blends with this side lot line here. It's 93 to 94 there. So we're just gonna do a little like retaining landscape wall to hold the existing shrubs there. Then the transformer will be dropped down like a foot and a half. Transformer is about six feet, six foot six tall, and five feet wide. Those shrubs that are in front of the house, and we have some pictures of them, are seven feet tall. And one's uh, like an evergreen year round, the other couple in the center are uh, a burning bush, I think. So that'll be actually two feet lower. The top of the transformer will be two feet lower than those shrubs. And we're gonna add some more screening on this side. Um, I emailed the direct neighbor here and showed them what we wanted to do and asked if they had any input. Um, I have not heard from them. I said, you know, would you rather have a fence there or just shrubs, and I think shrubs would be better to blend in with the existing shrubs that are there. And when you're looking up from Main Street, that transformer just kind of be blended into the shrubs. So that's, I think, the big changes in a nutshell to the site plan. All the other setback requirements and everything are the same. The building overall, the old footprint, this section here was 39 and a half feet wide. We dropped it to 39 feet for the entire section of the building there now. And we shortened the entire building by a foot. The old one was the 168 and the new one is 167 from north to south. Um, but the setbacks here are the same. The north setback, 20 feet to the property line is the same. This little parking area is the same. Again, to say this mature tree, um, this tree is on the other property, but this one here, again, as I explained about the, uh, the island there. And there's actually three shrubs right here that I didn't know what kind they were, but I had a landscaper look at them. They're a Nahoki cypress. Never heard of them, but they're nice. 
he said, you know what you should do is transplant those over to the transformer. So that's a possibility, but I gotta look and see how, how big they get. Because they say Nihoki or Shinoki trees. But they're only about six and a half feet, seven feet tall now. So that's a possibility, but I'm gonna try to work with the neighbor there and just make sure they have screening. And I think the downstairs of that property there, and I'm not even sure if there's any residential people that live in that house on the corner of Gray Street. It's the uh, Center for Spanish Studies. So I think that's about it as far as the changes. Good. Um, so, I mean, if there are any questions about those changes, we're happy to answer them. The, uh, the, there was a stormwater report done. There are no changes. We still comply with Massachusetts stormwater standards. I think that's with Jason Skeels right now. We don't anticipate. I mean, he was on site with Bill, and there weren't any issues. We just haven't received a, a final sign-off from, from Jason. So. Uh, from what we understand, there's a very good likelihood that this is going to be continued, and so we would expect that prior to that next hearing date, we'll have something definitive from Jason saying, you know, no problem. So uh, that's the site. We can turn it to architecture if you'd like. Do you have any questions on grading? Because the site engineer is here. The grading stayed about the same, with the exception of the three parking spaces in the front there, I believe, and a little bit around the trash area, just to kind of mesh that slab for the uh, the outside bike covered area. Other than that, it's pretty much the same. Is that right, Bill? That's correct. Yeah. So, are you going to have the architect come up and show the renderings and such? That was a plan. Um, yeah, that might be good to have that information. Oh. Can I just question for the presentation now, just now? Sure. Just, just, can, you, can you do it on the, preview, the number of parking spaces lost? Zero. Zero. <clears throat> it's the same number. We just reconfigured where those five are in front of that building where it was kind of tight. So we put two in that back lot and the three up front, but it's the same number of parking same spaces. Numbers, but now, and then have there been compact car spaces in the prior? It's all, those numbers are all the same. Okay. Yeah. It is effectively now there's, could he put more parking spaces here? Sure, but I, I think on balance, given um, you know, the data that he's seen from Spruce Ridge, what we've seen you know, from 70 University Drive, for example, um, you know, the parking just isn't needed for this type of use, the, the, the just, breakdown. Just ask, yeah, just, just that we have. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Sure. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I have one question which, which uh, goes, comes before the architecture, I think. Um, is it still your intention to uh, uh, not allow undergraduates, uh, given the new configuration of apartments? Well, I think, Undergrads aren't a bad thing if you screen them properly. For instance, I have a house on 734 Main Street that's always been undergrads, and I've never had a problem. The carpet there I ended up replacing in about 20 years. You know, the interior doors, I lost two hollow core interior doors, you know, from boyfriend-girlfriend disagreements. Um, but that's it, you know, since 1982. And it's just it's all how you run the property and how you communicate with the tenants I understand and their that, parents. But, but you made a point last time parents. we were here that there would be no undergraduates. Right. That's now changed. If, if they're properly screened, I, I would accept them. I mean, I think so. Yeah. part of it is that after the last conversation here, I, probably my fault, said to John, why would you limit yourself? Nobody else. And I've had another couple of management companies say that. And I think it was you that brought up the Airbnb thing. No, Somebody asked about Airbnb and how they can control that. And I looked into the Airbnb rules and regulations, and they have a clause in there about um, third party you know, how they cannot accept third-party um, releases. So in my leases, I have the sublet agreement, and I check with attorney Farber, and he says, no, he says, you're covered, because they cannot sublet without my approval, and they cannot list it on Airbnb or any of those things, you know, without written approval. Go ahead, Jack. Just a minor thing. Um, it looks like you're working the island uh, to protect the tree. 
there, and I'm just wondering, we, we've seen uh, along historic roads there that the trees apparently are uh, sensitive to to the pavement if it's near there, and I'm, I'm just wondering uh, if, you, if it's sufficient or if you had, you know, a arbor, arborist look at it or that sort of thing. Well, yeah, Compared I had to an arborist, tree, I guess. I had an arborist look at it, and that's why we changed the island, because if you see there, um, on the upper part, the old pavement, the light gray, and that dotted line, that's pavement there already. Okay. So the roots are already underneath pavement right. there. So we wanted to open it up and let the trees, you know, root system, which is underneath that barn or the garage right now, um, once that's opened up, it's more, more root system for that tree. So it's actually going it's to be a healthier better. situation. Yeah. Yep. Right. Great. Thank you. If the if we could see the renderings of do you have <laughs> Okay. So if you had to put more parking spaces in um, in that part that's in that part that's green, how many I can't quite see how many spaces that is. Yeah. <clears throat> I think my attorney misspoke there. I, I don't think I really can put any there because we brought the building out farther and you have to be eight feet away from the building. The only way we can add is to do away with that tree and island and gain maybe two spaces there or go farther to the north and add two spaces there, which is going to compromise that nice tree that the neighbors really want to have stay there. But I think, you know, the parking, I've done some recent research and there's a lot of places across the country that have done away with parking limits for new construction. Um, they want the, the economic factor, I guess, to be more beneficial, and they're finding out. There was one study done in Cambridge and Boston that 36% of the parking spaces there are unused. And that actually equates to the situation we explained about my property next door. I've got 34 parking spaces there for 12 units. That's 140% over what's required, you know, the two per unit. And right now, there's like 11, 12 spaces that go unused. I have 23 cars there the last three years in a row. So all that data that's been done really since 2015-ish to July of 19 is when a Boston report came out, backs it right up. Just the millennials, and they're not buying cars, they're not buying houses. They want to get on that phone and pay their rent and find an Uber and everything. It's just the way it is now. Plus the location, you know, being downtown. I think that goes part and parcel to the rezoning of that area and, and kind of encouraging more walkability, so to speak, and less pavement. And as far as overflow park, and I can, you know, work something out and maybe use those spaces next door. But I really don't see that um, there's going to be an overflow park, and especially with the mixed use. Because right now there's more than one space per residential bedroom, or slightly less than one space, I'm sorry. 35 bedrooms, 32 spaces, but there's shared parking. You go over next door during the daytime, there might be eight or ten cars parked there. And all the other spaces are open. You know, so same thing here for business during the day. And if some of the residents are leaving, then it works out. Plus breaking it up like this, having the seven or eight spaces in the front there kind of is where the business is, and then residential in the back, and then shared at night. I just think it's a better balance. Okay. Okay, maybe uh, looking at the renderings will help everybody get a better so, Christine, view yeah. of the changes. Again, welcome. If you can just introduce yourself. Good evening. My name is Christine Royal. I'm an architect working with Maple Street Architects based out of Northampton. I can say that we really appreciated the comments and the feedback that you gave us last time about the massing of the building in general, which we took um, strongly into consideration and into use as we were relaying out uh, the new interior interior plans. Um, so we still have three steps in the building from the southern side with the office. Um, 
up to the smaller wing of the residential units and then the larger massing of the remainder residential units. Uh, we still broke up the facade. We're still running with the same um, kit of parts as far as the siding and the detailing and the overhangs and the way the windows are joined. Um, so we really worked hard to keep this as similar to the approved um, version as possible. Could we see the picture before? Mm -hmm. yeah, is that so that's before? Yeah, oh, thanks. After. Yeah, that's the before. Do that again, that's <laughs> <laughs> before, that's after. Right. That's current. Yeah. So you can see the majority of the um, the majority of the growth and the massing has been to the north side, which is not highly visible from the street. Really, the stepping that you can see, and I think you have the other rendering, right? right? Yes, the stepping that you can see, um, you know, from the street is largely the same. Is that the current? That's the current That's, proposal. It is the proposal. That's the yes. current. Is the previous proposal, yeah. same view. Yes. So I'll, I'll, it's like one of those eye exams. So I'll toggle. What's better, one? Then that's the oh, other sorry. one. Sorry, yeah. I already messed up. One or two? <laughs> two or one? Yeah. So the, it is largely the same. You know, we're really breaking down the mass with the the clapboards um, running horizontally, the shingling at the eaves, uh, the wood trim detail. You know, giving that horizontality to the mass, which really speaks to the original building on the site as well. One back one again. Yeah. Sure. Sorry. Thank you. No, it's good. What this new rendering does help to illustrate is the stepping in the front that John mentioned to accommodate the three parking spaces out front and the location of the transformer behind the existing signage and in front of the existing shrubbery. Yes, the meters are on the back side now as well. And the transformer is sort of behind the sign? In that, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a little shorter there. Yep. Um, are there any questions? The, the utility meters, that's what you're referring to. The utility meters are, are on the back side, the north side of the building. Right. Correct. Before they were kind of in the step of the building there, so they're kind of visible here unless you box them. Oh, I'm not sure if you can see them in the original. Did you see that? I, may I ask another question? Sure. What, what, and perhaps, could you jog my, my, mem jog my memory perhaps? Um, wasn't there an issue with the historical commission and the barn that's behind the, current build, the currently existing building? Have, was, didn't the question come up? Yeah. So. Sure. We did meet with the historical commission oh. last month, and we reviewed the barn with them. Uh, they have given us approval to remove the barn. Mm -hmm conditioned on John's continuing pursuit of a buyer or a relocation for the barn in the meantime. Were there any new concerns with the taking down the back and rebuilding the shed no, area? No, they were very positive about that. Okay. Could, could we see the side view again, the long view? So I, I would defer to my colleagues in the panel, but I wondered if the peaked roofs were a little more bigger or a little more centered, because it just, it looks kind of disjointed to me and kind of odd, especially that little one. Maria? What, what, we'll just, 
I'm not following you. I'm just wondering if it could be more symmetrical or the peaked roof on the right could be bigger to make it look more like a separate building. Honestly, this view is a little misleading because you don't really see oh. it from that angle much. It's really from the street. So um, the other view is really the public view. Um, in order to get that view, you have to be in the backyard of your neighbor, I think. Mm -hmm. floating a little. Really broad. Yeah. So I, I'm not too concerned about that view being, you know, um, sort of uh, not symmetrical and sort of more variegated. Um, I appreciate still the scale stepping back, and it looks like there's enough gable roofs that sort of matches the historic quality of the area. Um, and I appreciate that no, no parking was further removed, and um, I know that's been an issue, but um, well, architecturally, I think it still fits the scale and feel of the neighborhood. Yeah, I agree. It is a little bit more, it's a little larger, a little more blockish. Um, I notice on, from this view, the end, the green, you know, if you toggle back, you know, it is bigger and rises more sharply, but, um, but there's enough other details. Yeah, that's the new one, right? It is. And then if you go back to the other one. Mm -hmm. So there were some of the extra detailing on the overhang uh, the shading brackets. areas with the, the structure, how it's like a triangle, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting with the eye, I think, and distracts you from the building above. I was just wondering why you removed that and went with the cleaner lines. Yeah. It, it is more of a porch detail that we were looking at in this iteration so that the the rhythm of the porch posts in the original are picked up along that front end of the new proposed. Yeah, we felt that that kickback bracket uh, to the building didn't Sorry. really speak to any of the original detailing in the, in the existing building. So I see what you're, you know, trying to achieve. I just noticed with that other, that kickback bracket, or mm -hmm. it, it does sort of draw your eye to that. It and gives you, you notice a less of the, yeah, yeah, the the rise of the building. It was just a, mm -hmm. my first thought looking at them. Um, could you go back to the, sure. <laughs> this, this is Tom's job I'm good for tonight. And there seems to be a little less detail in the windows on the front end here in the blue, the, the office, right? If you go back to the Tom, you're getting yeah, good at this. I, it just looks like there's a little more detail there again. Sure. I think that that um, is not intentional, that we lost some of that shading in, the, in detailing in the windows. Uh, our intent isn't to change the window package. Okay. Yeah. Maria? Um, <clears throat> sorry if I missed this. See how there's three parking spaces in the front in this rendering? Yes. Are those new or? Those are new. Mm -hmm. that, that is what John was talking about That's, earlier yeah, yeah. and the request for the yeah, electric vehicle the, charging stations to be close to the transformer by the okay. utility. Yeah, because your rendering show one with it, with, with, without. And, right. um, hmm, be, yes, they weren't there previously, which is why they're not in the other rendering. the electric vehicles and compactness it's a little bit of a shame that it's so front and center that's the only thing I, I mean I see it in plan but now that I see perspective it's like oh you know without mm -hmm. the cars there it looks very nice but you know in reality you're gonna see parked cars pretty close to the sidewalk but um, that's just yeah I'm not sure we can do anything about that yeah. what about if there was um, like a bed with some bushes in the front on that part, would that distract and soften a little bit the, because you know we're seeing it as asphalt, but if you actually envision three cars there, now suddenly you've sort of got like a parking lot on the front, which oh, okay. at least they're electric maybe, but yeah. Um, yeah, could that, do you see anything that could happen <clears throat> to soften up that front lawn and maybe do a bed? Right. Yeah. No. No, the, the sign's right on the corner of the parking. 
Yeah. Yeah, we could do something. So you could look into that, even if it was a low bed, low plants, just something that sort of softens, like there's the cars. Mm -hmm. um, Anyone else have any comments on the front, Chris? I don't have any comments on the front, but I have comments okay. on the rear of the existing building when you get around to that. The rear. Okay, so, and Chris, you have a question in the rear later? Okay. We had this kind of very attractive, kind of, I don't know if it's a Victorian style, but it has a little fancy stuff on it. And the building that you're proposing, not so fancy. And I just wondered if there could be something that you could put on the posts that would match more. Mm -hmm. Do you know, like a little, I, I don't know the technical term, but I, sure. I own some myself. <laughs> we could definitely look at the, the detailing and the trim on the posts. I would be hesitant to replicate the existing um, because it, it is not an original and we don't you know, want to give sort of a false sense of development. Um, but we certainly could pick up that bracket detail idea and... Yeah. Yeah, as part of the language. Yeah, sort of tying back into like the previous view where it had the, the brackets. Mm -hmm. Not saying use the bracket, but just some no, I understand. something that yeah. adds. Um, we can look at some architectural somewhere. detailing for that. Great, um, Michael. Do you? Yeah. I thought I heard yeah, I um, I was very enthusiastic about the original plan in terms of the massing mm -hmm. and the. Um, relationship of, of the uh, mass of the, of the new building to the old building. Um, I find this one a little more problematic. I don't think it's a deal breaker, but uh, I wonder if there's some way to soften that wall that now faces the street, which has no, no fenestration at all in it. The other original plan, as I remember, can you go back to the original sure. one, Tom? Well, it doesn't have any, but it's, it's, um, it's set back further and you see the windows in the, in the rear building facing the street. Uh, and there's no similar, um, that looks like it, the, 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 uh, the old plan looks like it could be almost two separate buildings that were just close to each other from the street view. This looks like one solid building. And it seems to me that the notion of it being uh, two separate buildings, in, uh, imaginatively, uh, fits the notion of um, infill and the idea of what I think we need to be going for in that general area of town, which is letting the old buildings be the dominant ones visually and having the new buildings be sub, uh, supportive or secondary visually mm -hmm. to the original buildings. Supporting Here, cast. Hmm? Supporting cast. Supporting cast, yes. Here I think the new, the new building is, is the star. Uh, where the old in the uh, in the original plan, the old building w w took the focus, mm -hmm. uh, and I wish we could figure out a way. I wish you, as the architect, could figure out a way to um, de-emphasize the mass of the new proposed building uh, at to the to the benefit of the existing building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I certainly appreciate your comments on that. I think partially through the color choice and the fact that the existing building is much further forward, that it really reads more clearly from the street. Um, so with the massing, we could look at maybe some window locations that might help break up that, that front facade a little more. Functionally, what's behind that where the arrow is now? Is that, a, is that an apartment? It is an apartment. There's no reason that a window couldn't be there, is there? Not that I can think of off the top of my head. Could you click back to the old one again? Yeah, so building on Michael's point, when you look back at the blue building in the back, they were larger windows also that drew your eye more, where I think in the new rendering, they're probably bathroom windows or Those something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, they almost look undersized a little bit mm -hmm. for the wall, but I understand this why, but... Um, maybe that's all the more reason why there does need to be something on that green wall or an accent up in the triangle. I don't know, you know, again, we don't want to make it too much of the superstar and more of the support, but um, yeah, it doesn't, it, it isn't as pleasing to, from the street as, as it was before. Yeah. It's just big. 
Well, it is bigger, so, yeah. Could we look at the side view again? So the green space is nice to have that. That does help break it up. Um, it's hard to see in a rendering because you undersize the, obviously green in real life is nicer, the trees are nicer, and they will grow. Um, I noticed you don't have a, a tree in that area, like on the right part. You know, I don't know if a tree could fit there. Anything right. We didn't sort of want to mask the building in the yeah. rendering. We wanted you to be able to see it. So I think in the landscape plan, you know, we can we can definitely talk about uh, placement of you know different different plantings. Um, but as far as the renderings go, we really tried to keep those down so that you could see it. Yeah. So what I was going to say then, if we went back to Street View, I don't know if. There's Mr. Reedy, the, the lawyer, then there's Tom, the clicker here. So <laughs> <laughs> if the clicker can go. Um, I was just wondering, again, when you're looking at it from the street, if there was a tree, you know, in that area, mm -hmm. is that, I don't know. It would, it would make some scale and uh, legibility impact for sure. So from, for me, what I like is the, the rhythm of the facade as you look down this sort of yeah. uh, roadway, alleyway, streetway. Um, I, think I find that, to be, that rhythm to be really pleasing. Um, I do understand the concerns about the, the massing as the building has gotten larger. Um, but a tree is a, is a good idea to help sort of mark that differentiation. Are there any other questions? Um, I know Chris has one about the, in the back, is there a certain view that the, that Tom can put up for you? <laughs> maybe they were just getting to describe that and I, maybe we should let them go ahead and describe that and then I'll make my comment, okay? I know, is, okay. Sure. So as I mentioned earlier, we did review this with the historic committee. And you can see in the front, the left two drawings, that the intent is to rebuild the smaller shed-like addition that was probably put on in the 50s. It's hard to really date that piece. Uh, with a very similar function, a trash and uh, bike shed with some exterior covered bike storage as well. And so the other two views are, you know, moving around the north side of that building, looking at the bike shed um, from basically the top ones from the fence line. And this is the plan of it. So the doors now come, they face the parking lot rather than mm -hmm. the north side of the property. Correct. That right. makes sense. Mm -hmm. yep, and it also has a covered location for the mailboxes now. You can see that adjacent to the door. Mm. And is there only going to be bike storage in there or? Bike and trash and, and recycling. Ah, mm -hmm. oh, there. And I assume, Chris, this is all allowed even though it's sort of in a grandfathered area. It's very close to the property line. So that was the issue that I wanted to uh, make a comment on. Um, originally, when you approved this, um, they were proposing to leave this old structure as it was at the back of the existing building. So now they're proposing to take that old structure down and build something new, which is really more functional and slightly bigger, but that doesn't really matter. But the issue is that um, the building commissioner has determined that as a result of putting this addition on the existing building. The existing building is non-conforming. It's closer than it should be to the property line. It's four foot six from the property line, and the setback on that um, western side is 10 feet. So that makes the existing building non-conforming. So if you alter a non-conforming building, alter, expand, or I forget what the other word is, but um, that requires a special permit. So we just discovered this in the last couple of days that um, putting this new structure on here is going to require a special permit in accordance with the building commissioner and in section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw. So um, I think 
you know, I've explained it to Mr. Reedy and Mr. Robleski, um, but the building commissioner <clears throat> recommends that the approval of the site plan review wait for the special permit public hearing so that you can approve both at the same time. Um, so I'm, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but my suggestion would be uh, if the applicant and Mr. Reedy wanted to go ahead with this special permit application, they could um, file it before Friday. Um, actually, if they could file it tomorrow, that would be really good. And then we'll probably be able to get it on the February 5th uh, um, planning board agenda. I'm pretty sure. So that would mean, and it's just a uh, um, an application. We'd need um, an abutters list, which I think we can get, and a fee. So it's not a big deal. You don't have to submit drawings or anything like that. But I think that would be the route that we would suggest going and try for the February 5th public hearing date. Good. So we need to continue the public hearing. We will. Um, I just want to make sure there's nothing else that we need to get from anybody else. Like, yep. Oh, and then Janet next, but Chris. So two things that I would recommend. If um, Mr. Reedy could get Jason Skeels, the town engineer, to submit uh, an email saying he has no comments or he has you know, some comments, whatever he wants to say, we would need that. And the other thing is um, there's been talk recently about locating a propane tank on the site. So either you could treat that as a condition, you know, come back, show the planning board, and um, get approval of a location for the propane tank, or they could have it for you on the 5th of February, and then you could approve that as well. And I think those are the only issues that I have. So that could Yeah, no problem. John met with Amerigas today, so it's Great. a non-issue. Okay, yeah. Janet? So I have a couple of questions. One of them is, um, could you tell me the estimated rentals for the studio, one bedroom, the rents, just a sense of that? Yeah, just, I mean, yeah. I'm not going to put it in stone, but I'm just. I can only, I guess, comment on what, like, University Drive is rented for. They're similar in size of the one bedrooms, mm -hmm. and I believe they're at 1400 Not right now. Less right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the studio, like, just if you can run through the studio, I think it'd be, be like a thousand. Yeah, I think studios there are eleven fifty, and yeah. one bedroom I think is. Yeah, these studios I think are a little bit smaller, like three hundred and twenty-five square feet. And but they built in, you know, a storage area in there, so. Okay, and then the two bedrooms and the three bedrooms. Well, there's only one three bedroom, and that's only because where the stairway is to get up to the third floor or the second floor rather, we have that. Um, area that's above the office that's kind of incorporated into that second floor, same as the last plan. Mm -hmm. um, three bedrooms, I would think, probably around two two thousand. And what we're trying to do, you know, with the gas company that I met this morning, is the propane is going to be a, more reasonable than electric, as far as heat. And right now, the plan is uh, to pursue supplying the hot water, similar to what they have on University Drive, and uh, including that in the rent. And then have them have a, the bigger units, two bedroom and three bedroom, would have a gas furnace in the central air conditioning. Two bedrooms, um, to answer that, I think it's probably around 1850. Okay, are there. David? I, again, my memory might not be, is easily inaccurate, but it seems as if the, the current proposal has the ADA bedroom on the far, on the north end. And I thought that the previous iteration, it was towards the front of the building, towards the commercial space. My question has to do with, it seems as if the three, um, handicapped parking spaces, I think there were three, are not in close proximity to the ADA bedroom. Well, they Am are. The, they are? Yeah, the first plan, we had no ADA unit. Because once you go over 20 units, then you need an ADA unit. Okay. 
Okay. Um, so this here, the ADA unit is on the north end of the building and the sidewalk with the two parking spaces right there has a slope and it goes right up to that door. So it's actually in closer proximity to it. I think part of it is that originally and still, all of the first floor units are group one accessible. Uh -huh. And as John mentioned, once, once we went over the 20 unit count, we have a group two accessible, uh -huh. which is a more fully accessible unit. And that is located close to the parking. Thanks for that memory. <laughs> Janet? So um, I would like at the next hearing, to get more information about parking, because it seems to me, like I went and actually looked at the, how, the unit, the apartment you have around the corner mm -hmm. on a Sunday morning, and there were, out of the 30, how many spaces did you say? There were um, 34. 34 spaces, 28 were full. And so that was just, you know, I decided Sunday morning was good. Yeah. And so um, our bylaw requires two units, two parking spaces per unit, and then, um, there's ways you can waive that. And I, it's not clear to me what waiver section that you're going for, but I think that I, I, feel, I need more, or we need more information about actual use and alternatives. Is like a parking management plan that would reduce expected use? Um, I've been pulling up data about bus use and, you know, and um, I've asked for information about the number of cars. My, you know, bus, bus use is down over, by 5% over the last five years. Um, there's all this data about people who commute to work. 50% um, of Amherst residents drive by themselves to work. Fortunately, some other people are carpooling. Um, so there's a lot of information, you know, traffic is up, it's not down. If, if people were driving less and using mass transit more, you'd expect those numbers to be the other way. So, um, and also, Maybe if you're going to use University Drive, which is obviously a lot of students that could either walk or take a bus to UMass, that's sort of different than this situation. So I feel like I, I need to apply the waiver that's in the bylaw, and I need information that supports it. And so is it, you know, and actually I was thinking the VFW lot across the street, which, you know, I drive by constantly, I'm sorry to say I drive so much, but um, is often empty, and maybe that would be extra space for people. But I think for me it's very important not just to fulfill the law of the Bible law, but make sure that the people who in this building have enough places to park their car. And the only reason the building is bigger is because you've taken away spaces to get more units. And obviously to make more money, which is your job, you know. Well, but our job is to make sure it kind of works for the tenants as well as, and there's no street parking, there's no option of that either. So, so I, just, I just feel like I need more information and data that would support that and we're happy to provide it. I just one clarification: there were no parking spaces lost. There were 32 before, and there's still 32 now. So just but you just added a lot more apartment units. So am I, more am I, units, am I, five beds. Yes, yeah, but we didn't lose. I, I thought I heard you say that we lost parking spaces, and I just wanted. Oh, to I clarify guess I misspoke. That. Yeah, okay. but yeah. I mean, you just need more, and sure. the and the reason your building is bigger because. There's You're not providing that yeah. parking. And so, you know, it, and the, my other question is, is there more space for more parking on there somehow? Yeah. To address, you know, the 28 cars next door, usually on weekends, you know, there's a boyfriend or something that don't visit just on a weekend type thing. Mm -hmm. But you can drive by there most any time during the day or, you know, work day. Morning. Morning is early in the morning or... And you'll see there's, there's open spaces. And so, you can look so, at other places. So too. that's use. I mean, you have people coming over, that's use. And so. <clears throat> so, um, you know, having somewhat of a parking management uh, write up is probably good due diligence to front load that. Um, I know we'll up provide. till now you haven't like assigned spots or. But, you know, is there a way you could have it in your lease that you tell them, like, you're only allowed one car? Like, you know, make it very specific. Yeah, that's and if they were to ask and say, oh, we have two cars, maybe you have a couple of solutions that they, you know, there are people who rent their spaces or lots. Well, that's kind of the way I was looking at it, figuring one car per unit, you know, for studio, one bedrooms, and even a two bedroom, maybe yeah. two for the three bedroom. So there you're looking at 24 spaces for residents. Yeah. 
So if so that was written eight, down, we'll put something eight, together. That, that would yeah. be helpful. Yeah. Um, we'll provide additional information justifying the request for the waiver, and then we'll also part of that probably will be some parking management plan, like. That would be good. It would be a little more clear. I mean, I personally would hate to see more any of the green space go to right. more asphalt. Yeah. I, you know, it's finding that balance. balance. Um, right. Jack. <laughs> did we, uh, or did you discuss having a, a walkway between, uh, is it Spruce? Spruce Ridge. Spruce, yeah, Spruce Ridge. Ridge. And this, I, I, it seems like we talked well, about there, that a bit. Well, there's yeah. kind of a cow path walkway there, because, right. you know. Yeah. <laughs> But I think um, I actually thought about putting a sidewalk or something there, and I was discouraged by a couple of people, insurance agent, number one, as far as liability. You know, as far as people falling and stuff like that. I mean, now they find their way over to the bus stop. I think I mentioned in the last hearing that when I was working at the property there one day, one of my tenants from next door went to get to the bus right in front. And then he's walking back, and I said, what happened? He says the bus was full. So, I mean, that bus, Route 30, starts at Belchertown, mm -hmm. old Belchertown Road by the old landfill, stops at Rolling Green, you know, Colonial Village, a whole bunch of other apartments, mm -hmm. and it gets filled up. So I think part of the so solution is to have PBTA either add a bus or put the stretch buses in there or something, because he had to go back and he hopped on his skateboard, if you remember, and skateboarded up the street. Now, University Drive complex is 1.3 miles from Whitmore. This is 1.2 miles. Hmm. And it's more of a direct, you know, route right up Triangle Street. So just That's a point of information know. on that. You know, and then a lot of, a lot of people do Surprising. walk. If it's a nice day, a little exercise. Nine minutes to walk from there to the bus, the bike rack up here in the center of town. 20 minute walk to, say, Whitmore. Thank you. Chris. I just wanted to note if there were um, thoughts about using the VFW across the street. It gets a little complicated because then you need to get a permit for the VFW property to use their property for overflow parking. So just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Uh, Michael. And there would be some danger in crossing Main Street uh, at, at rush hour uh, to get to the VFW parking lot. I don't think that's a good solution. Um, I just want to. I'd just like to point out that, um, and this is not really directed at your proposal, but uh, for the board. We've spent a great deal of time in the last year talking about parking at various developments. Um, and it all re relates, seems to me to relate to the fact that the zoning bylaw calls for two spaces per unit, um, which every developer that has come to us has claimed to be inappropriate, too onerous, too many parking spaces uh, for the current market. And that may well be true, and I, I don't dispute that necessarily. Uh, but I do think it means that we as the planning board, and perhaps as the, the zoning subcommittee of the planning board, really need to investigate that number, whether two parking spaces per unit is an appropriate zoning bylaw at this point. And in order to get to a decision about that, it seems to me we ought to have some kind of study, not simply one that relies on what's going on in Boston or other places, because uh, as I've said before, Amherst is not Boston. Amherst is not an urban area. It is its own very particular kind of world. And we need a study to, to help us determine what exactly the needs of parking for new apartment developments is. Um, and uh, I think we need to charge the, the zoning subcommittee with investigating that <clears throat> and developing a way to get a good study which gives us information about Amherst, not about some other place, but about this place, and then craft a bylaw that relates to that. Um, I just want to assure you that it is on the list. It is on our short list, top, top 10 of uh, things that need to be looked at and changed with a bylaw. We have some other stuff we gotta do first, uh, but it's on the list. Um, regarding a study, um, we do want it tailored to Amherst, but um, usually doing those studies, you go and look at best practices and you do go look at other towns that are similar. Um, and what the recent trends are. Um, and I think uh, 
as that bylaw gets rewritten, that's what will happen. We'll be looking at best practices and, um, you know, consultants are writing articles about this all the time. And no, we're not Boston, um, but there are comparable towns that we can use. So we will follow up, I hope, uh, you know, maybe less than six months. We've got a lot on our plate, but it is on the top of the list, I can assure you that. And it is a personal interest of mine, parking. Everybody knows me and parking. So, so yeah. I wonder if I can Gina. make a comment. So um, just to depress the world further, um, parking, the use of buses in metropolitan areas, except for Seattle, is down. Um, car, the sale, car sales are up. Boston is mired in traffic. People are driving more, not less. Um, but you know, we've been doing a lot of master plan stuff, and I've been reading a lot of plans. And the transportation plan says, directs us <clears throat> to study the actual parking supply and its use versus the occupied floor space. So the transportation plan from five years ago is telling us to look at this, and then it says to amend the zoning bylaws to reflect actual utilization, not un untailored guidance, which I don't know what that means. But um, I think we have, to, we have to apply the bylaw that we have here, and if we keep on deciding that it doesn't really apply, we shouldn't do it. We're actually taking over the town council's role of amending the bylaw. And so we have to follow the bylaw that's written here. We, I would like some actual use of comparable properties. And you know, during the day, a lot of parking lots are empty. Um, if, if it's a low income area, if it's a low income project, there's a lot, um, a lot less parking because people can't afford cars. The people living in here will be able to afford cars, and they may not be going to UMass. They might be going to work, um, and then they're most likely to drive. Chris, um, I just wanted to mention that um, the planning board has a lot on its plate, and one of the things that I hope the planning board is going to be looking at over the next year is um, redoing large sections, if not all, of the zoning bylaw. And if we do tackle that project, um, we're hoping that we can get some consultants to help us on certain pieces of the bylaw. And the parking section is one of the pieces that we feel that we really need some consultants' help on to give us um, guidance about what do other communities do and what is the best practice and standard throughout the country. So um, we, we are intending to study that. And it may take a while, but we're hoping to get there. Great, so we have a list of to-dos. Um, Chris, is that pretty much comprehensive? Then we, you'd think that we would have everything on the 5th um, so we can make a decision. Is there any public comment you're gonna hear tonight? I, yep. Um, so Chris, are, you don't, that okay, we don't need like fire or anything like that to look at the parking lot or? You might wanna just flip through your um, development application report. Um, where is mine? Yes, Janet. I have a quick question from the development application report on page four. Um, it says there are four new 12 foot tall post lamps proposed to light the parking lot that turn off at 1 a.m. And this might be the same as the previous proposal, but I just, I thought that 1 a.m. was really late to have a light burn, like four lights burning, and I wondered why that time was picked in an earlier time might be, I just, I just wondered. I think if people are out and about at night, they're usually home by 1 a.m. And after 1 a.m. we have the uh, Ballard or Bollard lights you know, along the sidewalks and the entry lights. So I think there's still plenty of room. So um, I guess if you're asking if they can go off earlier, I don't see why not. Though it is, there is a point where restaurants and bars, you know, are open till one, um, and there's a liability issue. I think the thought that they go off is good because a lot of parking lots they just leave them on yeah. till the sun rises. But um, yeah, do, what do you have in your other apartment building? Yeah, those are actually on all night. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> so just guess. But that can change. So yeah. <laughs> Chris. <laughs> so I noticed that I, I went back and looked at the site management plan for the previous application, 
and it is um, different from what we would expect for this application. The number of units um, is 16, and now we're looking at 24, and there may be some other things having to do with exterior lighting. So I would recommend that the applicants and his lawyer go back and look at the management plan that they submitted last time yeah. and update it so it's in conformance with this plan so that when the planning board says this uh, property is going to be managed according to the management plan that we have the right management plan. Is that clear? Yeah, we've got an updated one. Great. But yes, it's clear. Okay. And uh, Michael? Uh, yes, con continuing on the question of lighting on page four uh, of the sign plan, uh, it suggests that the lights, uh, ground based, ground mounted, uh, shine up onto the surface of the sign. Uh, that strikes me as not being dark sky compliant. Is that correct? Yeah, that's it's, yeah, I, I mean, I it's think the same grandfathered lights is what I remembered same, before. Yeah, it's the same lights focused on the But if you were to change on them, the that is a point that if you change the electrical system, um, change the lights out, you might want to go with down. Goose, gooseneck, something yeah. like that. And we'd have to yeah, change the... on the top of the sign itself. Right, that's what you're saying? Yeah, well, if we did that, we'd have to change the sign design because right now it's like a... You know, the sign is mounted between two posts, so we'd have to have some kind of a bar or something <coughs> shine down. I think you probably could mount them on posts which come up from the existing posts as opposed to on the top of the sign itself. Yeah. Well, the way these are now with the uh, planting bed around there, with the stone planting bed, the lights are down below the top of the stone, so it's just uh, the light itself that's shining up. You don't see the actual fixture. But just I think he's concerned but, about light bleed yeah. up into the night but the sky point is the light goes to, up to Not focused oh. on the sign yeah. itself. The new lights that we insist that they're down, face downward, and not up. But from what I remember before, it, you weren't changing the light. Right. You were going to use the same lights. But if you were to, I mean, so you're being asked: Is it an option to change that system to downward mm -hmm. lighting? Um, yeah, I mean, you can certainly look at that. We'll look at it. Come up with something. Okay, great. Light, sign lighting, great. All right, so I think we have our list. Any last questions? I was going to open it up to public comment. Okay, I don't see any. Is there anyone here who has any questions on this project or is here for it? Um, I, I see one. So if one of you gentlemen... Um, could um, let Miss Pam sit and ask her questions. Welcome. We know who you are, but if you okay. could tell the who Dorothy you are. Pam, two two nine Amity Street. Just one quick question: Is it possible not to have the parking in front of the building, the the spot three right near the sign, so that? It's, because I think if they work really hard to make a nice building and then you're all working on that with them tonight, it would be nice not to have the cars in front. Um, they addressed this a little bit earlier, but mm -hmm. they can talk about it again. It mm -hmm. has to do with the electric charging station being near the transformer and those three spots. Of course, they're going to be compact spots. Mm -hmm. Any compact car could park there, but the hopes is that they will be electric. Um, and is that correct that... It was suggested to, instead of running it all the way to the back lot. D okay. Perfect. So, thanks. Um, any other public comments? I see none. Um, so at that point, we could uh, continue this to February 5th. We could say a time. Chris, I don't know what we have on for that day. Can so we far, you don't have anything. You could continue this to 705 on February okay. 5th. Okay. Do I hear a um, motion to... So moved. Close the public hearing and move it to February 5th. Just continue. Like that. Oh, continue. Sorry. It's okay. Continue the hearing. Thank you. <laughs> sure. I'm thinking close, move. Yeah. No, we'll take continue it. it. <laughs> continue it until February 5th at 7.05. Is there a second? Second. Mm, any discussion? Chris, that's all good. Okay. All in favor and uh, unanimous. 
Great. Thank Thanks you. A lot. And we'll see you on the 5th. Great. Okay. So, um, anyone else want to break or should we can continue? Okay. Just want to check you're all good. All right. So, we'll move to item four. Uh, it's a public meeting, uh, subdivision, Amherst Hill subdivision, sub 1989-13. Continue discussion on request by residents of Amherst Hill subdivision that the planning board rescind the release of lots that were that were released by the planning board on May 1st, 2019 from the approval with covenant contract dated July 2nd, 2003, recorded in the Hampshire County Registry of Deeds, book 7555, page 61. So I'll wait for everyone to get settled. A lot of people taking their seats. Um, Chris, do you want to do an update first and then invite people up? Happy to do an update. Um, so since the last meeting, which was December 18th, um, we've done some investigation and um, I think we've made some progress. Um, first of all, the planning board asked me to reach out to Michael Pill, who represents um, Tofino Associates to ask him to put in writing in a letter with on letterhead from his office um, the uh, offer or information that he sent to the planning board last time in the form of an email. And that was that um, planning board asked that Mr. Pill uh, outlined Tofino's plan for finishing the road and giving the board a date by which the work on the roadway will be completed. Um, the planning board requested that this date be sometime in the summer of 2020 and um, something like July 1st and not by the end of the construction season. And also the board asked me to reach out to find out if my, Mr. Pill would, um, on behalf of his client, would be uh, interested in signing a new, um, either a new three-party agreement or um, submitting a bond for the difference between the amount that was in the three-party agreement and the amount that it was actually going to cost to complete the road. So um, subsequent to that, Mr. Pill wrote back, and I think everybody has a copy of that letter. The planning board has copies. Mr. Reedy has copies. And probably anybody who wanted a copy could get one from the back table. Um, and essentially, he did just uh, he did reiterate on his letterhead what he had put in his um, email that the uh, the Tofino Associates has every intention of um, finishing the road, um, that they would finish it by the end of the construction season of 2020. And um, then he made a suggestion at the end of his letter, which um, caught the attention of our attorney, Joel Bard. So um, the suggestion at the end of Mr. Pill's letter, which I really paid attention to in the last few days is that um, not to have a new three-party agreement, but to issue a new covenant. And the new covenant would cover the nine lots that were released last spring but haven't yet been sold. The nine lots that are currently under um, a request by the planning board to the building commissioner not to issue building permits. Um, so I discussed that with our town council today and our town attorney today, and he thought that was a very good idea to reimpose the covenant for those nine lots. It would be, it would have the same effect as rescinding the release, but it would be a cleaner way to do it. And he is um, ready to draft up a new covenant and that would be brought back to uh, the planning board for signature. Um, and at that time, if that new covenant were recorded at the Registry of Deeds, we would um, request that the 
original letter that I had sent requesting that the building commissioner not release um, building permits, that that be um, rescinded. So um, Joel Bard thinks that is uh, the best way to go in this situation. Um, I did talk to him about the possibility of our department imposing uh, fines on, on the uh, developer if he didn't uh, do what he said he was gonna do. Um, Joel Bard dissuaded me from that action. Uh, he thought it would not necessarily be appropriate in this case. He said that type of action is best used for sort of repetitive cases like people who um, don't uh, follow the build, don't follow building code, don't follow zoning code, um, something that is easy to explain to the court and easy to get them to agree, yes, you can impose a $100 fine 30 days in a row, and yes, you can try to get your $3,000 from um, the person who's not doing the right thing. In this case, it is a very complicated situation, and it would be hard to explain it to the court. I could <laughs> do it, but Joel Barr didn't feel it would be really worth the effort, and he didn't feel that the court would understand um, what we were trying to get. So he recommends that we follow the, um, the procedure of reimposing the covenant for those nine lots, and I believe I could probably bring back that document to you for next time to, for you to sign. So that's the recommendation that we have for you. Uh, could you explain um, so you can just issue a new covenant? Um, the, uh, the developer is offering to do this. The developer is essentially agreeing to do this. You yeah. can agree to do it as well, and then it would be the same as if those lots had not been released, but it wouldn't be the same as rescission of the release. So you said it could be drafted and it would come back to us for January 29th or the 5th? One of those dates. It depends on okay. how long it takes Joel to draft it. Then he'll send it to Michael Pill for his review and then it'll come back. So it'll probably take a little back and forth to get it right. But it seems like the right um, path to follow. Um, that seems pretty reasonable to me. How does, do we want to take that path for now and, and get a draft and have it come to us next time and we can all do a little research on this concept and, Janet? So we draft the, co we, we, you know, if we approve the covenant, do we file at the Registry of Deeds or does the developer have to do that? Either one. I asked Joel that question, and he said either one can file it at the registry. Um, well, that sounds reasonable. David? Um, so prior to May 1, 2019, there was a three-way party agreement related to this property, the subdivision, which um, provided financial, some sort of financial uh, security for the completion of the roads such that they could then be handed over to the town. And in addition, there was a, a, a restriction on the release of these lots. Is that, is that am, I, am I correct in that? So there were two there were two pieces of security encumbering the developer correct whereas the proposal would be to remove one of those pieces of security that is the three-way party agreement and restore the restriction on the um, release of the lots until until performance has been made is that a fair well, summary? There's still a performance bond of 288000 That doesn't go away. I think um, Mr. Pill is, is recommending that that go away, and Joel Bard is 
agreeing that that can be done. Um, the nine lots are worth a lot of money. Um, you know, I don't know exactly what they're being sold for these days, but if the estimate to finish the road is $930,000, nine lots are worth more than $930,000, and the town holds the ability to, um, to get the money out of those lots with the covenant. I'm glad you asked that. So we do a new covenant, but the performance, the existing bond goes away. Why? That would go away. Yeah, that, that, that's what I was just going to ask. If I could add to that, um, so I think this idea of the covenants makes sense. I'd keep the bond, you know, extra insurance. And when the sentence in this letter, Tofino hereby elects to terminate the existing agreement, that's just not the way things work. We have a written contract that's enforceable, and you just can't say I'm taking my toys home. You know, so I, I, I would recommend just letting that sit, keeping the bond, and then doing the covenant. I don't understand. <coughs> I don't understand I, that I agree. sentence. Like I read what they wrote, but when uh, Ms. Bestrup was explaining it, I assumed you were only talking about the covenant part. Um, yeah, so I guess you could you so I'll write have to go back, back to Joel Bard yeah, and, and ask right. him about that. Right. And then, yeah, I've got another question. Yeah. I don't. I, th I guess effectively there's no difference, but to restore the covenant restricting the release of the lots versus the planning board rescinding its decision to release the lots, it, it seems like really kind of parse. No, actually I can see differences there. I, I see. Okay. That, but that, but that's what, that's what Mr. Bard was proposing was to, and, and that's what Mr. Pill is proposing, is that it's restoring the covenant, it's not acting on the covenant to restrict, it's not acting on the prior planning board decision. Okay. Do you have a question? Yeah, uh, David, maybe you can explain this. Is that a, is that a, a difference without a distinction? I don't understand uh, why it's different. It seems a little more protective of the planning board in the town, and that's, I think, um, uh, an interest that I think we have. Thank you. I also remember uh, Mr. Bard saying that he couldn't find a case of a Commonwealth planning board rescinding lots, so it was sort of a yeah. fuzzy, unknown yeah. area to even to, yeah, even unknown. Okay, so that sounds good. I still also, if you're asking them, you know, they say end of the construction season. I'd rather have a hard date, whether it be like October 31st, you know, construction or when the asphalt plants close, like, because that's hard to read. It just takes an early snowstorm and all of a sudden you're like, oh, out of time. Uh, anything else that we want Chris to either ask the, either of the lawyers or look into. I don't see anything. So I was going to open it to public comment. Um, oh, so bef before the public comment, do you have anything you... I'll never turn down an and opportunity. And this is Mr. Reedy, not, <laughs> not Tom the, the... That's right, not the clicker. The clicker. That's okay. right. Uh, yeah. Good evening. For the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson uh, here in Amherst here on behalf of the residents of Amherst Hills. Um, I think the recommendation made tonight by, you know, I think ultimately the full board from what I'm hearing, but I think what Ms. McGowan said was uh, pretty on point, especially, I think it's, if you haven't read the letter yet, I think you have to read the letter and understand the tone of the letter um, and understand uh, what Tofino just consistently is looking to do. Um, and it's, I think it's just trying to skate some responsibility. So our suggestion would be to increase the security, and if that's by way of covenant and keeping the performance bond, you know, that tri-party agreement, we think that both of those things together serves to uh, protect the residents so the town has some collateral should uh, Tofino not complete the roadway. So, but we just suggest you look at the tone because this is our what number meeting and they still haven't showed up and I, you know, I think you just have to read it carefully. But yeah, we, we're supportive of the recommendation. 
I do believe you had a court date, um, which is the suggestion of arbitration. I was wondering if that had started or if there was any movement. Yeah, um, it has started, and so there have been some, there's been a motion hearing in land court uh, last week where, again, the representation was made by Tofino's counsel that they would complete the roadway. Um, they also are to get the court a definitive number with quotes uh, for how much it's going to cost to reconstruct and complete. And I believe that date is January 21st that we're going to get that feedback back. Um, and so we think, you know, with that track moving along and then with this track by the planning board, ultimately, I think you'll hear, if you hear uh, from the neighbors, they just want to make sure that these roads are going to get done. I mean, that's reconstructed and then completed. So, um, you know, ultimately, we think the covenant and bond is the way to go. Okay. That's it. Great. Uh, any questions for Mr. Reedy? Okay. I think there we're all good. Um, so I am going to open it up to public comment, um, and I want everyone who feels they need to be heard to come up. I just ask, like, <laughs> as Mr. Reedy said, um, We've seen all of you a lot of times, and we, we hear you, and I hope you see that we are continuing to work on this, and we are very sincere about it. Um, so if you want to come forward, but again, you know, if you've heard someone else sort of say what you've said, we, we hear it. So, um, and it looks like you get to come again in a few weeks. So um, at this time, I'll ask for a show of hands. Who would like to come up and speak tonight? Raise your hands. I see, I see two, three, and I'll ask again after we have that, but, and you're on the fence, you're not, okay. So we've got three and, and a half with Mr. Master Alexis. So, um, so the first three, um, I'll start on the left-hand side. Oh, oh. Um, yeah, if you two want to talk, I'll go to the other two, but I'm, I'm not gonna, hold up the meeting for, yeah, okay. Um, so I saw this gentleman. I think there's another man in blue behind. Oh, he's going out too. All right, so sir, you're the only one I see right now with your hand up. Please come forward. Thank you. And I have been here before, so I, I have. won't repeat anything that I said before. But, but please um, repeat your name okay. <laughs> at, for the minute takers. Um, and my name is Brian Scully. I live on 22 Hawthorne Road in Amherst. Is um, your mic light on? I just want to make sure. And if it is green, yep. try to talk into the mic. Okay. Um, first off, I've we've always come a little earlier in the thing. So tonight was the first time I had a chance to actually see what you guys do. <laughs> and it's the first time I've heard a developer talk. And honestly, it's a really impressive thing. I mean, those guys, they're clearly good, honest developers. They're telling you the things they want to change in the deals and everything else. And you guys are thinking them through and asking good questions and then double checking everything to make sure it's all kosher, you know? I mean, it, it's very impressive. And again, I'd never I've seen it before. So that isn't what I came up to talk about. What thank I'm, you. No, but I, it's really something. I don't know, I don't watch the TV thing, you know, the, you know, the, the I local wouldn't TV, watch it, you know. I <laughs> um, but the thing I wanted to ask tonight, because before I think I've asked you guys to try to put yourself in our shoes, and I think you have. I think you've given us a pretty fair hearing, and you've done some good stopgap things to help us. But tonight, I'd like to ask you to put yourself in Tofino's shoes and base, try to figure out what their intentions are from their actions. And I say that because everything they say is different than what they are going to do or what they have done. We were approaching them in the summer of last year to try to get those potholes filled because they were dangerous. I mean, never mind cars could get damaged or anything, but kids were driving their bikes around or, kid, or cars were coming at the same time as a kid and they're swinging into the other lane because they don't want to damage their car. So it was a serious thing. And they said, don't worry, we're going to take care of it. Ted Parker had a heart operation in April, but we're on it this summer, don't worry. And then we finally called them in to talk to us in person in September. 
And it was like, oh yeah, don't worry, we're gonna take care of it. We're gonna have it all squared away, don't worry, no, no problem. I'm gonna see to Jason Skeels in two weeks, he's gonna tell me what he needs, and boom, it's gonna be done. Well, nothing. And then we came here to complain to you guys and let you know what's going on. And uh, you decide you're gonna go out. Two days or one day before you came out, that's when they did it, okay? So their feet were to the fire. But here's the thing, if they're gonna do what they say in that letter, they're gonna take care of everything, they're gonna you know, figure out the cost, they're gonna pay for it, they're gonna do the whole thing. Why aren't they here telling you that? If it was me, I'd be crowing to everybody saying, I am so unfairly accused here. I'm just a businessman who's trying to do my best. That's not what they're doing. They're sending letters instead of coming here and telling you. And they're saying things like, you know, rechange this covenant. I guess that means a contract or whatever. But if they're saying, don't worry, we're footing the bill on this, why wouldn't they increase the bond? If it costs less than what Jason Skeels thought it would, they won't spend it. The money's not going to be gone. They'll get to keep it. I mean, why is that? Why are they, uh, sounds like, trying to get the bond to disappear in lieu of these lots? And I, I don't have as quite a high opinion of the value of the lots, to be honest with you, because the roads are going to be in such terrible shape. Who's going to want to buy a house or build a house when they know they're going to have a twenty or $30,000 share of having to build the road so Amherst can take them? So I don't think they're doing us any favors here. And I, and I do wonder, the bonds seem like such a good idea. And you guys negotiated in the beginning when it all made sense and the, the, the prices were less and everything. But everything has changed. Why aren't they willing to change the bond? It's not pop money out of their pocket if they don't spend it. It's just a protection for us, and I guess for the town, that, that we don't have to reach into our pockets and do it. I'm not selling my house. I'm, st I'm here. I'm here for life. But there are people who want to, and they can't just for that reason. And those lots, yeah, they're pretty. Some of them are really nice. Some of them aren't. Some of them are kind of wooded, and some are, are going to have trouble with the, uh, the Conservation Commission. So I don't know if they're worth as much as everybody says. But just go by what they're doing is, and saying as opposed to what they're promising. And I don't see anything coming through. If that guy sat here right now and said, yeah, I'm going to pick up the tab. We're going to raise the bond. We're going to do this. You'd have 100 people applauding him. Why isn't he? Why aren't they taking credit for doing the decent right thing? I don't think they're going to. And I think this guy, Pill, is a really smart lawyer and, and is way smarter than me because I didn't see it. Thank God you saw the thing about the, uh, the bond disappearing or whoever saw that. Jesus, that's scary. I mean, that's the only thing you really got. That's worth 300 grand, you know? Um, the God knows what those other things are. So I'm just asking you, ask yourself, why, what are they really doing here, you know? Because you've identified with us really well. I think you understand what it's like to be us. But if you're looking at them, I swear to God, I'd be, I'd be running for mayor because I'd be telling everybody how great I am because I'm making my, I'm keeping my deal, I made a lot of money, and I, everybody's off the hook. They're not doing that. Thank you, and I'm sorry I talked so long. Thank you. So I'm gonna ask again, after there's been conversations, how many people would like to come forward and talk? If I can see a show of hands. I see three hands. So I'll go from the left, and there's two and three. Welcome, just remember to um, state your name and address. Hi, Blake Spirko, 53 Concord Way. I just, again, gonna ask, because it seems like we keep doing this, is ask that we increase the bond. I am concerned that five of those lots have vernal pools there's meetings on the Conservation Commission, and they are not going to be worth nearly that much money, security. I think the, uh, you know, the Tofino uh, knows this, that those are not going to be worth that much money, and that um, and we are going to be then stuck where we were, been talking about not having an increased bond, um, because they won't be able to use, they're going to be of little value. Um, thank you. And, and the other thing is there's other things beyond doing the road on that checklist that's worth, as we know, lots of money, and that's what Hopbrook and Kestrel, they have both coat. The road is done, but they still haven't been able to finish, get it submitted to the town. 
there's you know all these other things like the um, that are on that punch list that the um, town manager gave us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the second, the gentleman in the blue in the back. Hello, good evening. I'm attorney Andrew oh, Pass. I represent Please, Burton. sir, sit down and, and then speak into the mic because there's people at home. <laughs> All right, very good. Watch this. Yeah. Uh, um. Good evening, <laughs> attorney Andrew Bass. I represent Burkeem Construction LLC. Uh, Burkeem owns nine lots in this subdivision that's subject of this conversation. Um, I think first of all, the, the lots that you're discussing uh, as holding security that Tofino owns, um, those are practically uh, unsellable, so therefore they would not constitute sufficient security for um, the Tofino obligations to finish this road. Um, as it's been mentioned, there's some vernal pools and various issues, but more importantly, last week, uh, through the land court action, Tofino encumbered everyone's lots um, by filing their litigation. So um, <clears throat> last week, Tofino asked the land court to grant um, notice of list pendants so no one can sell their properties anyway right now in the subdivision. Um, <clears throat> so I think uh, on that front alone, there should be an increase in the performance bond uh, for Tofino to finish your obligations here. Um, and if you read this, this letter from Michael Pill, I believe that in itself is very troubling where he's saying that he, uh, Tofino will finish the road, finish constructing the road, um, <clears throat> but he's going to leave it up to the land court to stick it to all the homeowners and hold them responsible for whatever fees they decide to incur in finishing the road. So ultimately they're saying, yeah, we're gonna finish the road and then we're gonna back charge everyone that owns a home in the subdivision. Um, you know, it's just not right. That's not what the agreement said. That's not what Tofino agreed to with the town. Um, by, by developing this subdivision, they agreed to construct all of the ways and to finish those ways. Uh, <clears throat> that includes the infrastructure, base coats, drainage systems, everything. So um, unfortunately, I think Tofino is in a position right now where they're going to have to put up more security and that's not gonna come in the form of these lots. It needs to come in the form of money. Um, so that's, that's really all I had to say tonight. Thank you. Welcome, if you can introduce yourself. Yes, thank you. Alexandro Mayu, 73 Linden Ridge Road. Um, Happy New Year, good to see you again. Um, so so I, I would like to urge you, like you heard previously, um, from a few of us here um, to first check what these lots are worth because before proceeding with this particular suggestion because we do think that there's something fishy here. Um, but the other thing, separate topic that I wanna bring up is, um, is mostly request for some clarifications. Um, so when we are saying we expect the roads to be done by some certain date, does that include the top code? Um, does that include the town engineer verifying that this has been done up to the town standards? Is this the time that the town, the board, you would, um, or, or whoever is responsible for this, decide whether the roads will be adopted by the town? The reason I'm asking for these clarifications is because Construction is not quite finished in our neighborhood. There are some lots that haven't been constructed. And um, you know what is going to happen if roads get destroyed later on by construction trucks and so on and so forth. So I would like to understand exactly what we're agreeing to here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chris, so just, you know, there's a good point in there that um, you know, finishing construction is one thing, and then there's the whole process of the town accepting a road. Um, they're two separate things. Um, I, yeah. So the town council will have to accept the road. The town council yeah. goes out and does what they call laying out the road. That's what the select board used to do. They do that on the advice of the town engineer. The town engineer will inspect the road as it's being constructed, and if it's not constructed in accordance with the town standards, then the town engineer will recommend that the road not be accepted by the town. Right, and part of the cost estimate, the the listing of the actual items that the town engineer did, those, you know, that was done 
um, with Tofino. So that's sort of like the agreed things that are expected to be done. Um, it's not the final list, um, but that's sort of how everyone was trying to stay on the same page. But it doesn't happen all at the same time. Um, does anyone have any other questions or comments at this time? Oh, I see, I saw Jack first and then Michael. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> um, how, uh, what provisions would there be in terms of monitoring the repair of the area? Is, is uh, town engineer uh, going to be called upon to approve the, the, the sections and is that clear in the, in the understanding of the, of the paperwork that we're yeah. trying to communicate? I'm not party to the communications between the town engineer and the contractor, but I know the town engineer goes out and inspects these roads when they're being constructed. So if he knows that the road is being constructed, he'll go out and look at it. If he hasn't seen it, then he's not going to approve it. He needs to inspect the material as it's being put down. So is that an answer to your question? Um, I'm just wondering if it, if it should be you know, included in writing some extent that they uh, that will be done and that they have to inform the town engineer their schedule of construction and if there's a change they need to tell him so that he can be out there when they're reconstructing and laying the final coat he would have done this at um, over in the Kestrel neighborhood he he's worked with Tofino and that's standard business but like I said the accepting of the road is a different animal. Any other? Oh, and so Michael and then Maria. Um, this goes to the question of the adequacy of uh, a covenant. Um, several, two of, uh, of the folks who testified tonight referred to the presence of vernal pools in some or all of the existing nine lots that we're talking about. Uh, I'd like some more information from somebody about how many vernal pools are, are involved in how many lots and whether or not those pools make the lots uh, essentially unbuildable and uh, useless for, uh, for development. If anybody has any information about that, I would be anxious to hear it. Um, Chris, maybe. If, if there are, maybe we should have Jason Skeels come to that next meeting so that he can be available to answer questions like that. It's the drainage swales. He had sort of talked about how there's um, a lot of growth and they need to be cleaned out. I don't think they directly impact um, uh, houses. Do you, do you want to hear? You if I may, you may want to check with the <laughs> conservation agent just because I think we're talking about, you know, detention basins are one thing, but vernal pools are something totally different that can uh, prevent development of the lot. And so I think what we're hearing is that if those lots are undevelopable or minimally developable, the security isn't what yeah. we're being led to believe. So, so I think Erin Jakes is the, the woman who's the conservation agent. Maybe have a conversation. And my point is that that's not really what's in play here with us, like the vernal pools. And I do want to hear about value of lots, but we're not going to get into the problems of the lots and why some are more valuable than others. Um, I think we just want to focus on the covenant and then hear about the value of the lots and we want to look at the performance bond, but not get into existing problems with lots. Uh, I, I respectfully disagree. It seems to me that the, that the uh, covenant is simply a way of assuring that uh, sufficient uh, income revenue exists to provide the town with the wherewithal to finish the roadways. Uh, and if the lots are in fact not worth, are not buildable, then that significantly affects their value. And we should know that before we get into the question of, of using a covenant in lieu of a performance bond. I think if a lot is truly not buildable, it will have a very diminished value. And that's one of the things we're asking. Like, so I am saying, let's ask what the value of the lots are. If they are not buildable, then they won't be worth very much. But I don't really want to get into the details of 
the vet, why one lot is more valuable and this one's not. I, I just want to know more of a total of those nine lots and an estimate of what they're valued at. Because we're I, just looking at coverage of money. There's a sure. performance bond that exists. We're still in conflict where they've suggested to drop that. We're saying we want to keep that. Um, we have various cost estimates. And um, I also did, I don't know, Chris, I did ask for the town engineer to update his list, his, yeah. He was on vacation for two weeks, yeah. and then he came back with the flu. So he's essentially been out for three weeks. And this is the first week he's been back. So hmm. I have asked him, but I don't know. If you can put yeah. that on the list also. So I think at this point, Michael, just what I'm saying is we're trying to collect the data. Um, I just don't think it's really helpful if, if, if the residents start coming up and detailing about problems in different lots. Um, I'd rather have it either funneled through the lawyer, um, we'll get values of the lots, and then obviously you'll get to look at that and you sure. can critique it and say, oh, we disagree with this or whatever. And Do you we'll expect to get values? So when you say we're going to get a value, who is providing that value? I'm not sure who to get that That's value from. That's who we're going to find okay. out. Right. Okay. But, and that's why at this point I don't want to start throwing numbers around. No, that's, around that's fine. And yeah, yeah. Worrying I wasn't, about I wasn't suggesting we do that here. I, I was suggesting that we need to have that information prior to deciding whether yes. uh, Absolutely uh, agree. A, um, a, a, re, a new covenant is appropriate. Right. I just was not encouraging the public here to come up and start talking about values of lots because Perfect. It, it's I, I not agree. helpful. Um, we'd rather get it from, from other sources and then everybody gets the information, everybody can look at it and comment on it. Sure. Um, and uh, you can, I, I see, yep, let me go here and then if you have something else you want to come up again. Oh, yep, hold on. So, Janet. so speaking of money, so um, I wonder if there's a way to, is Tofino's collecting all these estimates, finding out what estimates he's getting? So, you know, Jason Skills had a very high number because of yeah, the way he way had to do yeah. it, but if the if it's coming in at a much lower number, that'd be useful information to know if we're covered. <laughs> well, that's I'll get to. You. So one other question I did have written here is they say in the letter, um, you know, that they're and they said this in their the previous. So it's older now that they were seeking bids for actual work and will begin uh, begin scheduling contractors. I was just wondering, are they running RFPs? You know, how are they soliciting the work? Are they just going with through their connections or were they going to go through the official bidding process because that gives you numbers so I don't think they have to do anything with RFPs I think they're just asking for bids and I believe that they are working on getting those numbers by next by January 21st which is a court date yes. and the court okay. has asked for those numbers so they are doing the bidding process cuz usually um, <coughs> okay so we could get numbers from that too um, and then hold on. Okay, so I see Jack and then Maria, and I'll get back to public comment. Jack, uh, I'm just was I had a question for Chris um, about the process. Of, we haven't seen a, a new subdivision uh, come through, uh, you know, last few years. So, uh, but normally all these things would be mapped out, uh, say the the natural resources and that. So. Um, I assume that was done, and then if there's oh, vernal, so old. yeah, I mean, it, it, I'm just wondering if the change in conditions that you mentioned, the, the stormwater creating things, and and that, and so um, delineations of any kind of wetland resource areas are only good for three years. Mm -hmm. So work could have been done back, you know, a long time ago yeah. that wouldn't be relevant anymore. I know that um, the applicant, or excuse me, the developer has gone to the CONCOM recently with some lots that he's proposing to develop or sell. And he, uh, I don't know what the outcome of those um, CONCOM hearings were or which lots in particular they were about. So I can find out about that information. But normally what happens is the subdivision is created, um, the roadway is built, and then individual lots as they come up for being developed are brought to the Conservation Commission, because it wouldn't make sense to do the whole thing at once since all of this expires in three years. Does that answer your question? Yes. 
And I just want to add on, because it was from someone had commented, that is usually why the town doesn't accept a road until it's at least over 90% built out, because it's true, continued construction just destroys parts of the road. So you don't want to have it finished too soon, and the town doesn't want to accept it till it's nearly done, which is another concept. Uh, Maria? I read this letter multiple times because I don't understand lawyer speak, but I, <laughs> there's one part that really jumped at me that um, I think someone in the public brought up where it's nebulous. Uh, what are we exactly agreeing to or what are they saying? So um, on page two, they were reiterating what they already said, which was Tofino intends before the end of the 2020 construction season to do the roads. But then to the very next paragraph, it says, in addition, um, the, where is it? Tofino will do this additional work. Right. In addition, apparently as a result of demands by the lot owners, the town now wants Tofino to complete additional maintenance items, which will require additional time to complete. So are they now adding on saying probably 2020? That was not including this additional request from the town, uh, from the uh, lot owners. So I guess I'm not clear, like, are they now saying that's not holding because there's it's not just about road work it's a lot of other things um so that's one thing just i'm still not clear exactly what they're saying and then right i mean say they do all the work and then those nine lots do get developed and then the large trucks rip up the roads we're right exactly. back where we started so i'm not quite clear what we as a planning board want to really uh, agree to. I, I, I guess one was the covenant, but then not lose the bond. But then do we want to set a date or do we want the roads to completion? I mean, there's a lot of things that I'm not sure what we're asking exactly. Chris. So if Tofino completes the construction of the road and gets the town to accept the road, then the town is responsible for maintaining the road. So if it gets... Um, you know, if it if it suffers wear as a result of trucks moving over it or whatever, once the town accepts it, it's the town's road. I just want to add, if you are going to ask um, Bard and Pill to communicate whether this 2020 construction season sort of promise that was listed is still holding, or are they now saying because of this additional maintenance items, it's changed? Chris. So I view the additional maintenance that he's talking about as being the work that Jason Skills described to us when we were on our site visit. He said certain portions of the road need to be milled and reconstructed, re certain portions of the base course. And he gave us approximate limits of what that is. So I believe that is what Mr. Pill is referring to as additional work because it wasn't work that Tofino initially expected to have to do. It would, I don't know if Mr. Scales is comfortable with this, but on his scope of work, it would be at least helpful to me if he had another column that marked items on that is either a, what he considers original construction or a maintenance item. I think he did do that because he talked did about he? milling certain areas and those were specific. And I think it amounted to about $200,000, but I can go back and ask him that question. Yeah, because there was other little, it's a big spreadsheet. Um, yeah, just ask him while he's going through it. Because if he can mark what's been done, too, that was the other thing. Because the, they refer to that. I don't think it's a lot of things on the list. But um, anyone else have questions? OK, so I'll go back to the public. And I'll ask um, who would like to come up and speak. I see. Two people who would like to come up uh, as a second time. Do I see any other hands? No. And you want to speak after them? Excuse me. Yeah. Can I can I request that the I, well we've we've heard you know you know how many times you all have been here and we've been here as well um, that that there be um, uh, that one resist characterizing the developer who's not present here and what your feelings are, the course of conduct 
that's occurred. We've heard a lot of it. But I, I don't think it helps your argument to disparage absent parties here. That's terrible. Okay? Um, for the sake of there, this is going to continue. We're trying to, we're, we're trying to understand it. But it doesn't, I don't think it helps your cause to disparage um, parties that are not present. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to start to the left, and I'll um, one, and then two, and and then you. So come up, and where it's your second time, I will ask to try to keep it as brief as possible to new information. <coughs> and you do have to state your name again. Blake Spirko, 53 Concord Way. I just wanted to say that it'll be very difficult immediately to find the value of five of those lots because the Conservation Commission is trying to look at it now to see what's buildable, and it sounded like to me the best I could tell is it's going to take until the spring to figure out that how much is affected, and I'm not an expert in that, and therefore it's going to be very hard in the near term to figure out what is the value of the five of those lots. And I, I just have a question. I just don't know. I don't know if we can say what the other four lots are from. Are they on the cul-de-sac that has not even the original paving? The other four lots were purchased by Burkum, and so those are out of the out of okay, consideration in this um, whatever this is proceeding. Okay, that's all I want. Thank you. Thank you. And again, speak into the mic and give your name again. Thank you very much. Attorney Andrew Bass on behalf of Burkeem Construction LLC, um, owner of uh, various lots in this subdivision that's um, in question here. I think, um, first of all, I, I do find that um, very troubling that Attorney Pill and Tofino are not here tonight, actually. Um, so despite whatever disparaging comments may be coming their way, uh, this is a very, very important matter for all of these people. and. Um, they're not here. I mean, you know, that's just uh, troubling in itself. Second of all, I think that there's some very significant misrepresentations uh, being made to this board. Uh, last week in land court, attorney Pill told the judge that the cost to reconstruct the road was around $175,000. Now he's coming in here with this letter and saying that, uh, you know, whatever the cost may be, they'll do it. We don't know what that cost is. The number's bouncing around. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that when Tofino started this subdivision, they agreed to construct the road. Um, now, I, I believe that it's not their intention to pay for that. They're going to pay for it initially, and then they're going to back charge the homeowners for something that they were obligated to do to begin with, um, which is another very, very troubling thing. Um, to, to sell these houses, they've made millions of dollars off all these people, and they're coming back and they're suing these people that bought the houses from them to pay for the road that they promised the town they would complete. Um, so these were very troubling things that need to be addressed by this board immediately. Um, now, secondly, uh, as a brief anecdote to the value of those lots that the board intends on holding a security possibly, um, <clears throat> my client purchased whatever buildable lots there were. My client gave Tofino over a million dollars over the last couple of years and there are no lots that my client wanted to buy that were left that were buildable or profitable. Now you can take that for what it's worth, but my client's been building houses in this area for over 30 years. And it, you know, if he didn't want those lots, I'm sure no one else is gonna want those lots for that price. So that's, that's pretty much it. Thank you. I see, uh, uh, are there other people who wanna speak? I see one, two, two more hands. Is that what I see? Okay. Okay, so I'll go with this gentleman, then you're next, and um, then you. Hi, I'm Tim Farnham at 56 Linden Ridge Road. Just one very quick question. There's a cul-de-sac that I, maybe this has been dealt with before, but that hasn't, doesn't have any paving down yet at all. Is that part of what they're going to finish? So my question is then, it, in any kind of agreement that happens, if well, I guess that's that's for later. You're not going to be able to answer that, but that's not included in the in the in the finish. Okay, thanks, sir. Mm -hmm. 
My name is uh, Angelo Mazzocco, 57 Linden Ridge Road. The last time I addressed the board, I told you guys that Ted Parker and Tofino cannot be trusted. Now, a gentleman before me said that he's going to live in the house for the rest of his life. That's not the case in my situation. I need to sell the house <coughs> Excuse me, for uh, financial and personal reasons, and this matter is jeopardizing a very important procedure. So what I would recommend, which I think would resolve many of the issues, is that the board establish a deadline when the road work is to be completed. I believe that it was mentioned uh, beginning of uh, the 2021st, I believe that's too late. Um, they have had a great deal of time, but they should be able to do the work by the middle of 2020. So if that can be accomplished, I, would, I personally, would, personally would be very grateful. Thank you. I'll just repeat again, Chris, that um, you know we had suggested July 1st, and they came back and said end of the construction season, and I'm still pushing for like an October 31st or a firm deadline at least to get that written in a letter. Um, okay. All right, good evening, members of the board. My name is James Master Alexis. I live at 35 Linden Ridge Road, and thank you for hearing us once again uh, this evening and to all my neighbors for hearing them as well. So there's just a couple things that I wanted to mention. Um, first of all, and I, I don't know the answer to this, but I wanna bring this to your attention. There, there is a covenant in this matter, which I believe is 19, and I, I'm, is 2003, I believe it is. So my question is, if a new covenant is enter, entered into, does it replace that covenant that was in place which said in paragraph one, the work on the ground needs to be completed before the lots are released, which led to this whole issue when we identified that to say, well, the work isn't done and the lots were released. So my question is, and you don't have to answer tonight, I'm not saying that, but this is a little bit complicated that there is a covenant in place and would this covenant that we are now entering into, would it replace that? So I just wanna bring that to your attention so um, we don't unintentionally make a mistake. And I raise that because of my friend Tim, uh, Tim Farnham, who came earlier, who r discussed or uh, raised the undeveloped and unpaved section of the road. I believe, and I could be wrong, but I want to bring this to your attention and maybe town council's attention. I think it's a valid question. Did that previous covenant cover the on uh, the cul-de-sac road that's not paved, okay? That may cover the cul-de-sac road. This new one may not cover the cul-de-sac road. So that's a question that we cannot ignore, okay? Um, I think, and I don't, I don't wanna talk about the lawsuits, but I think the, one of the issues here with increasing security, okay? I'm comfortable that we're gonna win that lawsuit. We're, in, we're correct on this score. Okay, and if we win the lawsuit, there's always an, a possibility, okay, that, and we talked about this the last meeting, that Tofino just walks away. You know, we win, they lose, they leave. So that's the, one of the reasons why I think the security needs to be increased. And I hope Mr. Pill, and I hope Tofino does what he says here, that they're gonna do the work, and then there's not a problem. But if he doesn't, and then we prevail, and then we don't have to pay, I, I think there's a question. And, and a, a risk, and we don't, when you plan these subdivisions, we try, I think, the town and your body, um, the body of the planning board, tries to minimize these risks. So I think that's, that is a, an important point here. Um, I also think that there's a disconnect between what your engineer, Jason Skeel, who's been out to our neighborhood many times and has done a lot of work in the town, what he's saying needs to be done and what Tofino is saying needs to be done, okay? Now, I'm not an engineer, okay? I don't know what's right, but you know, Tofino's saying it's 175,000. They made that representation in court. That's fine, if that's true and the road gets done, 
Great, I don't want anyone to spend money that they don't have to spend. I'm not looking for a high number. Uh, I'm not looking for a high number. But there's a disconnect between what your engineer is saying and what Tofino is saying. So that has to be resolved. And I just wanted to say, uh, Madam Chairwoman, you know, we don't look at anything here as maintenance, okay? I just, I know you use that word, and I know it's been kicked around. This, this is a complicated matter, okay? We're looking at this as reconstruction, okay? We've got, you know, we're on a half-constructed road. All the people behind me are living on a half-constructed road. And through the passage of time and construction, that road has deteriorated. And in the three-party agreement, okay, on page three, that Tofino drafted themselves, it says the security in this matter shall also shall always have a relation to the t to the total cost needed to finish the subdivision, okay, including damage to previously constructed work, okay. So the security needs to be have a relation to the work needed to be done in the subdivision, including previous damage to previously constructed work. So the word maintenance here is convenient, but it's inaccurate. We're talking about reconstruction of damaged previously constructed work. So I think when you put those things together, increased security in this matter protects all of us. We are the town. The town is behind us, the people. You know, the Constitution, we the people. That's why we're all here in the first place. The people give the government the power to do, to regulate us, to govern us. And you've done, and I think my friend Brian was right this evening, you did a great job on the previous building. You know, you do good work here, okay? But we're in a situation that having to reconstruct a road is a fiction. It's just a fiction that needs to stop. Okay, um, I'm glad members of the board picked out the tone of Mr. Pill's letter. Um, switching gears a little bit here, the tone of Mr. Pill's letter. He, he punches you in the nose a little bit and he says, oh, you, you put the, uh, a moratorium on the building permits and this, uh, in an ex parte hearing, meaning without us, alone. You've in, we've invited them to every meeting and they haven't come and they say on page two of their letter in paragraph two, it's an ex parte hearing. No, it's not. It's not ex parte. Um, they, in the last paragraph, I'm glad Ms. McGowan picked this up, they're saying they're going to elect to withdraw from the agreement, the three-party agreement that has the town of Amherst and Greenfield Savings Bank, yet they say they can withdraw. No, they can't, in my view, okay? And you shouldn't let them, because in the three-party agreement, you know who can enforce that three-party agreement? It says right in there in the last two paragraphs, the planning board. If you, and I'm not saying this, I'm not saying you should do this, but if you wanted to tonight, you could vote to call in that bond of $288,000. You could vote to do that, because it says the planning board can enforce this. And I'm not suggesting you do that because this, but because this is a complicated matter. And when we, not me, when your and your town council draft this covenant, okay, I would suggest that we have some conversations before it comes back to you to say, did, you know, are there things that we need to look at like the undeveloped road, okay? Because it's a complicated matter. And I just had one other thing I wanted to say, but it just skipped out of my mind. I'm sorry. Um, so I thank you for your concern, okay? But as you can tell from my friend Angelo, who just preceded me here, okay, to several people in our neighborhood who want to move on from the neighborhood, okay, um, this is a tough one. You know, we're not a construction company. We're people who, in many instances, you know, worked hard, put all the money that we had up to buy the nicest house that we could buy. And now some of our neighbors need to sell. And we can't, and I know Mr. Bacume, I've spoken to him, can't, because if you buy into our neighborhood now, you're, you've become 1 70th of a construction company if you take Tofino's theory in this case. 
So I hope, uh, Mr. Levenstein, I didn't say anything that was negative to anybody, and I thank you for that concern, and I agree with you. We should make this decision on the facts. But the facts are the work wasn't done in a pursuant to the three-party agreement by June 30th, 19, on June 30th, 2019. You can re require additional security. That language was written by Tofino, and I, I think in the end, I'm not opposed to a rewritten covenant if it covers all those bases that I discussed, that we have security, so in the end, we don't come back here in three years and say, and say Tofino's gone, but we're still here, and someone's got to reconstruct that road, and it's not going to be us. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. So unless there's, Chris, yes. I just wanted to um, say one thing. I, I think, and this may not be true, but perhaps Mr. Reedy knows, I understand that the $175,000 is not the price of finishing the road. I think the $175,000 is repairing the parts of the road that have deteriorated. So Mr. Reedy might um, correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and if there's no more questions from the board, then I think we'll move on for this meeting and we'll um, continue this on um, February 5th. And I see no hands, so thank you all for coming. Ongoing process. Thanks. Okay, so it, I'm just going to stall for a minute here because it will be noisy. Yep. Okay, I'm going to continue now. Um, I'm going to move to item five. It's master plan update. I ask the members if it would be all right if I can move item B in front of item A, which uh, so we would talk about the master plan um, for the planning board and then we'll get into uh, A and C, the <coughs> CRC memo regarding um, the process involving them in town council with the uh, master plan update. So if we move to item B, um, it's, it, the item is vote to agree to move ahead with the master plan update. I'm going to ask Chris Bestrup to sort of update us on, on where we are um, with her and, and is a, her role in guiding us as a um, planning board and to, you know, repeat about how it's it's part of our jurisdiction and, and why it, it's overdue and why we need to do it. And then I thought it would just be a good idea to take a vote on it, voting um, some kind of motion saying that we were going to begin the process of um, updating the master plan. And that plan, uh, the uh, details of that, um, Chris will start to elaborate on and will work on over the next month. <coughs> Do you want me to start? Yeah, please. Okay. Thanks, Chris. So um, there have been questions raised about the timing of this update. Um, it's certainly um, true that the master plan calls for updating the master plan every five years. And it was completed in 2010. At the year 2015, we had been through, let's see, Mr. Musanti passed away. And I took over as planning director from Jonathan Tucker, who retired. So um, that was a very, should we say, tumultuous time. Um, then we had how many, how many town managers? We had Mr. Zomek. We had Mr. Ba um, Heckenbleckner. Heckenbleckner. We had Mr. Bockelman. So 
there was a lot of transition during that period. It didn't seem appropriate to um, try to update a master plan at that time. Then um, we started in the planning department putting um, suggestions about updating the master plan into our capital budget. Um, little increments, $50,000 here and there. Um, that didn't get, gain any traction because there are so many other things calling on the town to spend money on. Then we had the transition from town meeting to town council. And so that didn't seem an appropriate time to update the master plan when we were just having the town council getting its feet in, under itself and establishing its own um, priorities and procedures. So now, here we are, 10 years after the master plan was approved, saying um, we want to update the master plan. We want to bring it into uh, conformance with the things that we're thinking about now. We're thinking about climate change. We're thinking about resiliency of communities. We're thinking about sustainability. Those were things that we might have talked about in the time leading up to the time the master plan was adopted in 2010, but they weren't at the forefront of our minds as they are now. So um, the town council and um, the CRC and staff um, have talked about updating the master plan to get it to a point where the town council will feel comfortable in adopting it. The town council is required by the new charter to adopt the master plan. Um, so there's sort of a choice to be made. Do we go full bore and redo our master plan, which would take years and would probably take a lot of money um, in terms of hiring consultants? Or do we update the master plan now and then once we have information from the 2020 census, um, perhaps in 2024, 2025, we start an update of a master plan process that would um, culminate perhaps in two, 2030. Um, the charter requires that the master plan be updated or revised, I can't remember the exact word, every 20 uh, years. Yeah, updated, so 20. we have one that was adopted in 2010. If we have another one that's adopted in 2030, that follows Before. that timeline. Yeah. So at this point we are proposing to update the master plan to bring it into conformance with the things that everyone is talking about now include um, updates of demographic information. The population has probably changed since 2010. We're not really ex exactly sure, but the, the master plan that was adopted in 2010 was based on the 2000 census because it started to be developed in 2005. So bringing it up to date now with whatever census information we have or whatever population information, there is population information besides the census that we can use now, but talking about how many dwelling units have we created, how much agricultural land have we preserved, how much um, conservation land have we conserved, purchased, put under conservation restrictions. Those are all things that we can do now to update the master plan. But to go out to you know, a multi-year public process and you know, involve the whole town in this process now when Certainly the town council is absorbed with continuing to set their own procedures and figure out what they're doing. Now they have four big capital projects that they're starting to uh, grapple with. They have a budget season coming up. It's just not the right time, in my opinion, to um, open up the master plan for a complete redo. So updating it with what information we have currently, bringing into uh, the master plan, the things that people are really concerned about right now, that seems the right approach. So what I'm suggesting is that planning department staff take, um, take a stab at how to update the, ma the master plan and come up with a plan. I've invited you to send me your comments if you have comments. I think I invited you a couple of meetings ago Mr. Bert Whistle said he'd read the master plan three times, so he probably has comments that he would like to offer. But if any of you have comments about things that you feel particularly need to be addressed in this update 
I certainly want to hear those. I have my own ideas, and I've started putting together a list of the things that I think need to be addressed in this update. Um, I would be consulting with you frequently, probably every meeting. I could bring some pieces of this to you. Um, I'm proposing to update the master plan chapter by chapter. Um, that seems to be the right approach. Maybe we bring in people who know about a particular topic like open space and recreation. Maybe we want to talk to LSSC. Maybe we want to talk to the Conservation Commission for economic development. Maybe we want to bring in the economic development director. So you know, each piece of it probably has someone who is very knowledgeable about that particular topic. Um, transportation, maybe we want to bring in people who are associated with the Transportation Advisory Committee or the DPW. Um, so we have a lot of resources here, but I think we can do it small you update in-house with the planning board's um, cooperation and um, help, and I don't feel like we really need to go out and do a complete rewrite. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions, Michael? Yeah, uh, do you, do you, um, Ms. Brestrup, do you find the six-month timetable suggested by the CRC to be workable, given the fact that you may want to approach this chapter by chapter, and that presumably the planning board will talk about it chapter by chapter? That's 10 chapters. That's 20 weeks. If we talk about it one chapter every week. There's, there's our six months. And then it goes into the fact that it's got to go to the CRC for comments, and then to the to the council and then back to us. I mean, it's, there seems like about eight steps in there. I can't remember them all because it's very convoluted. And uh, I don't see how that could possibly happen within the time frame that they're talking about. Chris. Um, my own impression is that the six-month timetable is really an indication from the CRC about the level of um, update that they want done. Priority. In other words, they don't want 18 months, two years, three years taken on making this update. They need to grapple with a lot of zoning amendments that are going to be coming at them. They want to have some basis on which to decide whether zoning amendments are appropriate or not. If they haven't adopted the master plan, they don't really have that basis. So I think what they want to do is get the master plan adopted as an updated version, and then they'll be able to grapple with zoning amendments. So I don't really think that the six months is workable. I think it's probably going to be more like nine months. Maybe it's going to take us a year, like you said. Maybe we take one chapter a month or something like that. I don't think we can really judge that until we get into it. Some chapters are going to take a lot more work than other chapters. I think that um, the transportation plan that we did in 2015 did a really good job of looking at transportation issues. And I know there are things that we need to update, but I don't feel like there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that topic. In terms of land use, I think there's probably a lot that we need to do there. And that's probably going to take a long time. Economic development, well, you know, we've had an economic development director. I understand he may be moving on. But in any event, um, I think the town has a good grasp of economic development and probably the planning board isn't going to do a lot of heavy lifting on that particular chapter. So different chapters will take a different amount of effort, a different amount of input from others. And um, I agree with you that, that six months seems like a very short time to me, but I don't think it's going to take a year or 18 months. I agree with you. I think there's just a sincerity they're trying to stress that if you look, at, there's any bylaw changes that they have to approve, they're supposed to have the master plan approved, um, adopted under them. So they know that there's a lot of bylaw changes that need to happen and are going to be coming up. So I think they just really want to get the master plan um, updated enough that the, that the town council feels comfortable with it and they're willing to adopt it knowing it's not perfect, but it's a framework. And, um, and Chris, we also talked about how as we go through this process, we will realize there are a lot of areas that are very complicated and too complicated to deal with right now. And I think we were sort of using the metaphor of like putting them in a basket on the side. And then 
it, it will be kind of good to go through this process because it will get us very organized and identify areas that need to have a lot of attention and consultants and more public process or whatever that will set us up for doing a full uh, master plan update. Um, so I think little you is, is key that you're saying, but even looking at it realistically, if you went six months from now, it's summertime, and that would never be the time that the town council would want us to deliver a new master plan anyways. Realistically, it is the fall at the earliest um, when, you know, people are around and the town council's, you know, it's fall ready for work. So. Um, realistically, at a minimum, it probably is eight or nine months. Um, and just to remember that the CRC memo doesn't really, besides updating them, that's after we, we've passed it and, and approved it and moved it to them. So that's sort of after we've done our part. Um, any, yep, yeah, Michael, do you But have then it has to come back to us again. Not necessarily, not if they uh, adopt it. Ideally, they're, they're good with it and they adopt it. Yes, you're right, they could ask for things to be changed and those changes have to be come back to us. But ideally, that's why the CRC memo is important that they're trying to find a way that their town council members are feeling updated through the entire process and sort of coming up to speed on the more intimately with the master plan than it's not we just bring it to them and say, hey, read it and these are the changes. So that's what the CRC memo is trying to do. How do you suppose the uh, process of the CRCs being involved will go? Um, it, it seems to me uh, that that's um, complicated and problematic at the same time. What, what is your sense and Ms. Brestrup's sense of the way in which, presumably the, the, the master plan is the, is the planning board responsibility. How is the CRC going to keep track of what we're doing or have input or what, what, whatever, their, whatever the verb is, uh, how is that going to work? Well, it sort of says it in, in the CRC memo. I, I don't think it does. I think it's very, very, very vague, and it says that they want to have input. What does that mean? So if, if you read the memo, they want regular updates, and they, I, they're waiting. So part of it is they're waiting for us to define how we're going to update the master plan, in what process. And this is what Ms. Bestrup is sort of starting to carve out now. It's going to be chapter by chapter. We haven't got to this, but we talked about this in the zoning subcommittee and how it will funnel through that. And um, CRC will be, you know, probably send a representative and be listening. And then there'll be certain times where, like, we send them a final draft before we approve it. And that's when we ask for their comments. And then we address their comments. And hopefully, because we've gotten their feedback, there's no surprises, and it, we approve the master plan, and then they will vote to adopt it. You, you just said something about the zoning subcommittee being yeah. uh, involved. Now, yeah. that, that's yet another layer of involvement that wasn't referred to in the, menu, in the memo. Because so, it doesn't involve them. It, that's okay, our I understand, process I understand. we have to figure but, out. So what, what's going to happen is that the zoning subcommittee is going to review the, the changes that the planning department has suggested mm -hmm. and then bring those suggestions to the full board and the full board is going to debate and discuss them um, and then send them back. I mean, this, it, we're adding another layer here, which I hadn't well, anticipated given them. So, I understand that that's internal, but it all fits into that six months. Or, which is now a year, we've decided. But whatever that time frame is, right. it extends the complication of the deliberation. And that's where I'm really concerned that we're getting so involved in back and forth between this committee, the, the, sub, the zoning subcommittee, and the CRC that um, we've got way too much uh, um, communication complication. Going on. Well, let me just remind you how it worked with like town meeting. 
articles were drafted in the zoning subcommittee. That's why we have it. So that's sort of the working group, and they work with staff who does the bulk of the work. So staff brings it to zoning subcommittee, and that's sort of, you get to work out a lot of the, the kinks and do the reviews. Um, and of course, you are welcome to join the zoning subcommittee. Everyone on this board is welcome to be a part of that. So it would come there and just like the articles, you know, getting, the, it's the same thing as like getting them ready for town meeting. So zoning subcommittee would like grind it through the first time or maybe a second time. And then they would be like, okay, we don't see anything wrong with this. Now we're gonna bring it to the planning board. And then the whole planning board looks at it and gives their comments and feedback. And the whole time we're working with Ms. Bestrup and she's the one who's taking the comments back and, and re-updating. So it's not like this is a new process. We're, we're just saying we're gonna treat it like we've been doing all of our works before, you know, in the zoning bylaw changes, the same thing will happen. It, it goes through zoning subcommittee, keeps getting reviewed there, and then comes here. But just, I just wanna back up for one thing. So Chris and I kinda didn't wanna do this tonight. This is for another discussion another night. We'll be here all night if we actually try to drill out how we are actually going to do this, whether it's six months or a year, or, you know, if Chris has to get a consultant or, you know, like th that could all happen as we drill down, you know, Chris, we had talked at zoning subcommittee about kind of doing a draft run, taking a chapter, and she would start with one chapter and we'll see how it goes. It will tell a lot. If, if we get bound up on one chapter, well then we're like, okay, we're gonna have to rethink this a little or get a consultant, but we don't wanna get into the weeds of that tonight. The gist of this is that this is our responsibility. We are overdue on doing this. There were good reasons why our Director is telling us that she has been directed to do it. If you read the charter, it says that the town manager and the planning board are supposed to be doing this. So I'm saying we need to do our job and take the initiative up and at least try. This is, and Chris Bestrup is, is ready to lead us and do the work and we'll fi it, it could be bumpy and it could be big. And maybe it won't end up the way we, we hope, but I think we need to officially vote and say, yeah, we have to take this on. This is one of, this is our first priority for 2020. Because we can't even do bylaw changes until we get this master plan adopted by the town council. Who says? It says in the charter. No, it doesn't. Show me where it says that in the charter. It does, it, it does not say that. It says that all bylaw changes need to be reflective of the master plan. And we have and a master plan. It hasn't, but it has, the, and the master plan has to be adopted by the town council. Not according to the state bylaw. Not according to, but by our charter that trumps the Massachusetts law. You're right. So oh, you mean our charter trumps the Massachusetts state law? For that. Yes, we have to follow our charter. Massachusetts does not say that you, that's why this, we didn't have it done before. You didn't have to have your select board according to Massachusetts, but we have a charter that we have filed with the state of Massachusetts and it says that our town council has to approve the master plan and they have made it very clear, if you listen to their last meeting last week, um, that they, don't want to adopt the plan currently. They just would like it a little bit more updated so that all the members feel better about it. Some would probably adopt it right now, but they wanna make sure they get the vote and that there's been a bit of a, a that due diligence, like I said, this is our job. We are supposed to be doing this and it's already overdue. So I feel that we need to do our job and make an attempt to update the master plan in the most expedient manner possible so that we can get it to the town council and they can adopt it and we can start making zoning changes. I'm gonna let Chris talk and then you, because she trumps you. <laughs> I just wanted to say that I think that the CRC is more of a conduit between the planning board yeah. and town council. Yeah. 
The CRC is going to be delivering messages about what it is you're working on, how you're doing, what the tone of your work is, what some of the subjects that you're going to cover. They're not going to get into the details about the master plan. They may have suggestions, they may have recommendations, but that's, it's not their job. Their job is to keep the town council informed enough about what you're doing so when this finally comes to town council, town council will feel like, oh, we know what's been going on with this. I think we can vote for this. Otherwise, town council is going to be kind of, you know, off doing what they do and you'll be doing what you do and there won't be that line of communication. So for me, the CRC is the line of communication between the planning board and town council and they're not going to be you know, working on a daily basis with you about the wording of this, that, or the other thing. So, Janet. That, that was a lot. Um, so, I've been thinking since the zoning subcommittee meeting, and I've been doing some research on how you update a master plan, which, I mean, which is obviously, there's many ways. And I'd like to sort of just, I know we could talk about this for seven hours, and, um, but I would like to uncouple some things, is that first, I think we can all agree, I think we'll all agree that we need to update the master plan and it's overdue. So that's one, that's one piece. The second question is, how will the planning board do that? And that, that I think is a whole separate discussion. I have a lot of ideas for it. Um, I wish that the town council will, uh, would uncouple, and I don't know, I don't really know what's going on with that and have enough information. Their need and desire to adopt a master plan I hope they uncouple that from zoning changes. There's a lot of very needed, urgent sort of zoning changes that we need, and I think that, I don't think the charter says that they can't do any zoning changes until they adopt their master plan, because we already have, they said it has to be in, a, in conformance with the master plan, and we have one legally in effect. And so I just hope, like, if people, if everyone can sort of separate that out a little bit. Um, and then I think the, another discussion, which is, I think what Michael's mo talking about is, I think it is really confusing to figure out how the planning board and the planning department can work with CRC. And if we're doing the master plan at every, you know, bits of it at every planning board meeting and does someone has to sit here and then, this, this, and you know, it's just, to me, it, it is, seems very chaotic and confusing and it seems like we're not gonna do a great job because our planning board meetings aren't we, we are, we're so packed, we, you know, we haven't gotten to things that we tried to get to, you know, months ago. The other thing I would like to uncouple is, I would like to take this task away from the zoning subcommittee, which has been focusing on, on zoning and hopefully has some expertise on it, and there's so many things that we need to work on. And so I think as a possible process thing is that we form a master plan standing committee, which we can do under our bylaws or our own regulations, and have that committee kind of form and work with Christine and look at processes and try to figure out what's a good process and bring it back to the planning board. And so, and the good thing about having a standing committee for the master plan is it obviously doesn't have to meet every day of the week or every year, but it can do that updating process and then kind of keep monitoring and then go to the full on. And so those people will have that experience. And so. I don't think this, I would like to uncouple this work of updating the plan from the zoning subcommittee. I think those are very separate things. So, so I'm just trying to, but let's, I think maybe your first instinct was right. Let's just agree that we need to update the master plan. And the timing and the processes of the various interactions are worthy of a much longer discussion. And the CRC thing I find, and town council thing is confusing, but we're in a really confusing time. <laughs> The other thing I want to throw in is that um, Rob, um, I'm completely forgetting his name, the, the, the housing inspector, the inspector is going to be doing a, a bylaw update himself. And so I think that the zoning subcommittee should focus on that work and the 40R and things that are coming down the pike pretty quickly and stay kind of stick to their mission and let's do the standing committee on the master plan and focus on that separately. So. I'm sorry that was so long. Chris. So I don't think that forming a subcommittee of the planning board is a bad idea. And it could be many of the same people, all three of you who are on the zoning <laughs> subcommittee. It may be a wise idea to meet at a different time to discuss the master plan. 
and maybe we don't want to bring master plan issues to every planning board meeting. Maybe we want to have a one more meeting a month <laughs> to talk about nothing but the master plan. But these are all things that can be right. worked out after you decide that you want to update the master plan. Yeah. Um, do any of the other members feel up for um, a motion for updating the master plan? Can I ask a question that sure. just arose from what uh, what Janet said? Did, did I hear you say that that, um, Rob that Rob Mora was going to do a bylaw, do a zoning bylaw rewrite? Somebody, somebody. From town hall has asked him to do that, or Chris. So, there are sort of two levels of a zoning bylaw rewrite. One level is all the things that have been nagging at inspection services, the building commissioner, and the planning department over the years about things that are conflicting in the in the zoning bylaw. You encounter it yourself. One portion of the sign bylaw says. You can waive any portion of this sign bylaw. Another portion says you have to have a special permit to do X. How do you reconcile those two things? We have this discussion every time we have an oversized sign. Those are the kinds of things that really bog down the processes in town hall. So we need to get an understanding of that. There are portions of the bylaw that are inscrutable. You can read them 10 times and get 10 different meanings out of it. And we need to clear that up so everybody understands what the bylaw says. Many of the things that Rob Mara will be dealing with are on that level. If it works out, he can also include the things that you've already worked on, like the supplementary, supplemental um, dwelling unit, one that you came up with and presented to town meeting that was not approved at that time. But this may be the right time to approve that. Um, so there may be things that you've already done that we can slip in. Then the zoning subcommittee is continuing to work on zoning bylaws. And as those become ready, we can give those to Rob to fit in to his rewrite. There may be things that are too big to fit into the rewrite. And maybe those are things like inclusionary zoning, which are pretty big and very potentially controversial. So maybe we have to pull those out. Maybe we get... Um, a consultant to help us with that and we do have some money to get a consultant to help us with zoning bylaw so we're going to figure it out as we go along but we acknowledge at least we in town hall acknowledge that there are many really difficult aspects of our zoning bylaw that just don't work well and taking it as a whole instead of taking each little piece that doesn't work well and bringing it to town council we think that it would be better to just really try to redo the whole thing, and bring that to town council. So that's our current proposal. Rob Mara is planning to come to the February 19th planning board meeting and describe what his idea is. And of course, you're going to have to buy into it. Or I shouldn't say it that way. You will be invited to buy into <laughs> it. And then you can make your decision as to whether you do or not. And he'll be um, a much better explainer than I am right now. But. <laughs> That's kind of what's going on here. Uh, you're a perfectly good explainer. Thank you very much. <laughs> David. I, I would ask that when Mr. Mar comes in February, that he not, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I bought into the idea. I, I want, I'd like the details. Mm -hmm. I've been hearing about this for two years. And, and I am totally am sold on, well, you know, that there are what I'm, technical, just inconsistencies, glitches, things that don't work operationally or administratively. But uh, I'd like, I mean, I think that it sounds to me as if a list has, is, 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 has been and is in the process of being created. Let's get to it instead of talk about it, getting to it. I would, I would ask if at all possible. Um, and then as a second, I, 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 it's, I, I would move that the planning board begin to figure out how to update the master plan in a mm, circumscribed manner for a presentation to the town council when, when it's able to be presented. And I would again sort of urge that we really be um, narrow in our 
and the, the, the terms, the categories are necessary and obvious that Mandy Joe's memo has. And she seems to, they see, the CRC seems to have enumerated what necessary and obvious is, and just stick with that. With the caveat, the most important thing to me, it seems to, to be these four capital projects, which were, which need to be included in the master plan. And that were only, it seems, in the prior plan, mm -hmm, casually mentioned, as opposed to being uh, uh, at the forefront, which it seems like they were, uh, that, was, that was an oversight. So I, I have sort of a hope that if we work out a good process, it could, it could go faster. And so if we figure out a good process, and going chapter by chapter might be too slow, if we deal out the chapters, like decks of cards, and each, you know, I don't know, people on this committee each take one and, you know, work with Chris and talk to the, you know, like if I'm doing transportation, I talk to the tech, I could, you know, you know just do the rounds. Um, and we could do it simultaneously and not do it one by one by one, because that might just, we might just wind up telescoping out into, you know, the next millennium. And so, so I just think um, I totally support the idea of updating the master plan. I, I don't think anyone wants to go deep and redo the whole thing, but I think that if we have a good process and it's you know coherent and we run it along, I think it will have good results. And I think we'll have a better plan at the end and better understanding. But I still, you know, so I, I'm, I'm behind this, but I want to do it well and think about that process. And not also, I don't want to burden the planning staff and Chris, because like your list of to dos for 2020 was a little scary, and then I know, I know that you're down a person too. So I agree. I think we all want to do it well. Um, David, was there a motion in that? Because I, I, I move that the planning board move forward to update the master plan. How we do so is yet to be determined. Second. Uh, discussion. Questions. Uh, all in favor? And I see unanimous. Great. So now we can uh, put that on the next agenda. I know Zoning Subcommittee is also talking about it, um, starting to work with you, Chris, and how you want to at least start or trial or whatever. Yeah. So um, I understand that the CRC is proposing to bring their memo to the town council sometime soon, and I want to say it's next week, although I'm not absolutely sure of that. So I wondered if you wanted to um, talk about the CRC memo. And that would be the next item. I'm going to back next? up from B because oh, and go good. back to okay. A, which also involves C. Um, Thank you. Which we have vote to support process. Do we have to have a vote on that, or can we just send them recommendations? I didn't know. Or maybe Miss Pam can have a preference there. Um, so we have the CRC memo, and uh, we want to give some feedback. Uh, do you, we could just give recommendations, or should we vote to support the memo? I'm not sure what CRC is exactly looking for to bring to town council. Yeah. I think Mr. Zomick and Ms. Haneke did want the planning board to vote to support the process. Okay. Along with recommendations. Along with recommendations. Because we could say we vote, but with these considerations. Because I think we already identified one clearly with the six months. We want to say we hear them, um, that they want this done in an expedient manner, but um, we're already probably looking at eight months um, to a year, but they could, um, if they think a year is too long, then they need to come back to us and you, Ms. Bestrup, and tell you so that you can rework and determine well, what you would need for resources to make that happen if it does need to be that quick. Does that make sense to, okay. Uh, Janet? Oh, I, I, I would support the spirit of the memo without um, agreeing to the details because I do understand Michael's concerns and I did find it very complicated at the end. And I think that the problem that it, everybody's grappling with is, you know, we have our master plan and we have the authority over it and we'll approve it. And 
then the town council wants to approve a master plan and it wants to have some control over it and then there might be possibly different opinions on the town council or as there'll be different opinions here. And I just, I fear getting into a, a long back and forth and then also what if there's just disagreement? And so, you know, we're gonna update and adopt a master plan and they could disagree with that and then adopt their own master plan. And you know, that's not a great end, but, but the, the charter has that confusion. And so I, I appreciate the spirit of trying to do it quickly, not going you know the deepest dive. I appreciate trying to figure out how to collaborate and work together so there isn't that point. But I, I can't, I'm not sure I can say this is how it's gonna go when we don't even know how we're gonna go. So it seems a little premature to say we're committed to this process, but I appreciate the spirit of it. Just to remind you, they don't approve it. We approve it, yeah, I know. right? They're just adopting it. And in the memo, that's why they, at the time, it's almost like it will be a public meeting and it's formal. They get a final draft, and that is when they are supposed to give all their feedback and their recommendations. And that's when they're, you know, and CRC wants to make that clear that they're involved, they're getting updates all along, then they get a final draft, they review it, and then they give their feedback, and then we do whatever we, you know, do with those, and then we approve it, and then it, it gets presented to the town council to be adopted. Yes, you're right, there could be issues that get brought up, but that's not what's supposed to happen. I mean, we're trying to go with the process that they gave their feedback earlier, and it's not after we've approved, it's kind of like, well, we've already, because like, like you all said, it, the Massachusetts, by Massachusetts law, when we approve the master plan, it is the master plan. Mm -hmm. And we have a charter that they can, um, they adopt it, but we're trying to not have it that yeah. it gets Murphy. detailed and, and they, they ask for changes after we've already adopted it. That's kind of like awkward, it's, it's wrong. I would encourage the CRC and town council members to participate w in this process as we go through it and give C input. CRC does. Yeah, so I'm just, but just probably as any member of the public would too, just to, you know, we hear from them, we know what their concerns are, we're right. listening, we may not agree. Yes. I just wanted to suggest that the CRC memo outlines a process that we're going to try. Mm -hmm. And if there are aspects of it that become clearly troublesome and just don't work, we'll go back to the CRC and we'll say, how can we change right. this to make it better? It's not like it's carved in stone and mm -hmm. it's going to be like this forever if it doesn't work. So this is just a, kind of a starting point. It's to get us started on this path to make clear whose responsibility is whose and It's a get first going. time. A first time. We're on uncharted territory here. Yes, Michael. Um, why do we need to vote to support the process described in the CRC menu in the first place? Why not just simply go ahead? We've already said we're going to go ahead, move ahead with the master plan update. Why don't we just do that? I'm not willing to support the process as described in the CRC menu, I th the memo. I think it's um, uh, confusing and excessively complicated. I think if we just go ahead and do what we said we were going to do a minute ago and go ahead with the master plan update without knowing exactly how that's going to happen, but having a reasonable idea of how that's going to happen, doesn't that solve the problem? I, I, I just want to answer his question. Well, why do you have to answer the question all the time, Christine? It's not um, Because I'm the chair, and I'm repeating what Mandy, Joe, and, and Mr. Zomek said when they came here. All I was going to say is, Chris just said that they asked for us to vote on it. I had asked earlier, why do we have to vote on it? And she said, because they asked. Now, that doesn't mean we have to. That's point. So uh, I, that's all I wanted to just re repeat what was said earlier. David? Uh, I agree with Michael. And I think, uh, Janet, I don't think that we need to I think that we, we've, we've agreed to move forward in, in updating the master plan. That this is com complicated. I do have a lot of concerns about bureaucracy creep, which I is, think is, 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 is not productive. 
that we, um, I think, again, look forward to narrow revisions for necessary and obvious that's been outlined or suggested here, and that we, you know, proceed. And that, that and that's all, that's sufficient. That's the CRC and town council, they can do with their internal, um, you know, debates. But if this is our work, then this is our work, and there you go. Okay, so we have a memo here that we received from CRC um, that they're going to send to town council, and I think we've been asked, do we, we don't have to vote on it, but do we agree with the process? And if we don't, what I'm asking you all is we have to tell them at what points in this we either need clarification or it needs to be changed. They're, they're asking us for details on how to because we, we will go through our process, we will approve our plan, our master plan, but then it has to go to them to be adopted. So I think they're trying to, it's setting expectations. So if we have a problem with it, we need to be specific in where our problem is. Yes, David. I propose that the planning board move forward with the, um, looking at changes to the master plan, the currently approved master plan, to update it to reflect changes involving the form of government, the transportation plan, the com complete street policy, council climate action goals, updated flood mapping, and the open space and recreation plan. Since all of these necessary and obvious in quotes, um, uh, changes originated outside, I believe, of the planning board, according to the charter, according to the charter, section 9.8C, proposals to amend the master plan not originating in the planning board shall be submitted to the planning board for deliberation. So I, request, I would ask that Chris Brestrup ask the people the, or the parties that have been responsible for these various or could who could help amend and update the current master plan for those necessary and obvious changes enumerated by the CRC that they do so and submit them to us I don't understand again in paragraph 2 of the proposed process Paragraph two, number the two. last paragraph on page two. On page two. CRC's definition of necessary and obvious includes so on and so forth. What I bulleted: changes in form of government, transportation plan, complete street policy. There are other bodies that have done these, this work that can submit to us, I believe, with greater authority than we, than any of us have here, because th those other parties have worked on this material, that they can submit to us what, what, those sh what the updated master plan should look like, reflecting that work. Well, I think we mean that the master plan would just refer to the document. Like, I was the <laughs> chair on the transportation plan, but we dissolved five years ago, so, but, so we don't, like, I think the, up, and this list of plans is not comprehensive. There's a lot of other plans and so, but it's not that they have to be written into the master plan. They just have to be just mentioned. Like if you went to the transportation chapter, it would say like in 2015, there's no working plan. Great. And so that's yeah. the work that can be done. That, 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 right. the, that whoever, so Christine, so that you, would be Christine. The, 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 who, whoever owns has or who, wherever the, the, the transportation plan currently lives, that that be whoever, wherever, whoever you know in the town hall has has greatest authority over that submits to Chris. Hey, master plan sections such and such, such and such. We covered it 
in our transportation plan of 2015, let's, let's add that note. Okay. So I think I see what's happening. We're starting to slip into the actual details of how to get it done. And Chris does have some ideas about this where like the transportation chapter, she would call on other staff members like the DPW or Stephanie and, and using these plans that are already accepted, you know, sitting on a shelf, but are our, our processes and they would be in charge of writing it into the chapter, right? Several of these things have been incorporated by the planning board by reference already into the master plan. The planning board actually voted to accept or to bring sure. the transportation plan into the master plan as part of the master plan because they recognized the fact that the transportation section of the master plan itself was very weak. So that's why the effort was made. We spent $50,000 on it in two years probably mm -hmm. creating this transportation plan. So incorporating it by reference seemed to be the right thing. So I don't think we're going to be asking anybody to update or rewrite or do anything to these various satellite plans, if you will. At this point, we're just going to be kind of enveloping them and making sure that the text of the master plan actually refers to them so people who read the master plan knows that those exist. Otherwise, they would have to go back through planning board minutes to say, oh, the planning board referred to this on such and such a date and incorporated it by reference. So it's really just a case of enveloping them and bringing them in at this point. And then maybe in 2025, people will feel like, oh, the transportation plan needs to be redone. The open space and recreation plan has to be redone, I think, every five years. So these things all have a life of their own. But I think you want to say, yes, those are part of the master plan for now. So yes. that's my I, opinion. Okay, if I can well, go. Hold on. I just want to. Do you need any other information? So, okay. so I actually think that's not going to be a great process and lead to a really weird result because the master plan has like 100 plus pages and we have at least 600 pages of other plans. And if we can't say, oh, our master plan is 750 pages, go read it and follow it. But I do think it would be fairly easy because you know, having just read the transportation plan, a bunch of stuff has been done, right? And so we don't have to just say, oh, look at the transportation plan. And the, trans the transportation part of the master plan is really weak, but if we handed it to somebody who has been working on the transportation plan and said, hey, look at this section, look at your plan, can you just pull in the key stuff? And we'll have a new section that's updated, we'll refer to the longer plan, but we'll just be more current. I don't think that's a huge lift for anybody who's really experienced. If we refer to the housing production plan and the housing market plan, plus the housing section and the, in the master plan, you're going to be in this like labyrinth of conflicting and unclear things. But if having gone through those two plans, you know, a committee, a group, you could look at it and say, and talk to the housing people, like, what are the key things that we have to do, and what are the problems, and just you know, pull it in, not pull it in in 200 pages, but pull it in in concepts and updating. So I actually don't think pulling summarizing and pulling in the key I, stuff is going to be that hard. I think we get on a slippery slope though. If like you're right, maybe transportation or the housing one is pretty easy, but Chris has a lot of reports. Like you just said, there's a lot. I think we're just trying to do an update. We're not Well, trying. that's actually why I don't think Chris and the planning department should be harnessed with this. That's why I think we should have a, a committee that is but, but coordinating that process. But a committee doesn't write it. We're they not, don't do the work. That's I'm, I do the right. I could do writing on that. <laughs> you know, I, but that, I, I have mean, some people who are worried about how much work it's be, and now you're saying you're willing to write. You know, it. Like, when I when I talk to <laughs> when I talk to experts about it, they say the first thing you should do is form a committee and look at your implementation, yeah. see what you've done, and then. But that's for feedback and for comments, and we're not for writing it. Like town committees don't write like. Okay, we're getting into the weeds again about how to do it. And everybody has a different idea and a different amount of work they're willing to take on. And um, Chris will come to us at the next meeting with more detail. We can, we'll be here all night if we try to figure out this plan. I'm back on the CRC memo and I am looking for feedback specifics on where you need it, you, you feel it's unclear, confusing, needs reworking. Michael. I think 
uh, along with what David said a moment ago, uh, a motion to, uh, I can't repeat your, mo your motion, but um, that motion, uh, in lieu of um, voting to support the process described in the CRC memo, is, an, is, the, is the better way to go. Um, I have so many problems with the CRC menu, uh, memo that um, I, it's hard to begin to enumerate them. Uh, but I do want to point out one that is particularly difficult. Um, let me bring it up here. Yeah. Um, the, uh, this is in the same uh, microphone. Yes. Uh, this is in the same um, section that David was reading from a moment ago. Um, the um, CRC is understanding that the town Wh staff. Which paragraph? Last then? paragraph on page okay. two. Um, uh, understanding that the town staff has been compiling a list of potential uh, revisions, et cetera, um, including uh, revisions to uh, reflect the changes in the form of government. Fine, I have no problem with that. Uh, changes in the town priorities since the approval of the master plan. Now, that may include those specific committee things that we've been talking about, but is, doesn't it changes in the priorities of the town, isn't that a huge area of, that requires considerable discussion? Who is to determine what the changes in the town priorities have been? Is there a list of those changes? Is that the town council's view of what the changes are? Is it our view of what the changes are? What does that mean? So the result of, the, the result of my question is, it, is that we can't deal with this particular memo as it's written, that we have to just go ahead and do our business. I think as uh, Ms. Haneke said, they were coming here not trying to tell us how to do our job, but the first two things that popped in my mind are that the capital projects and the green initiatives that we have taken very strong votes on, those are priorities to me in recent time and they need to be reflected. Now, she doesn't say that, that's what comes in my mind, but again, I think they were trying to be very clear that they weren't trying to tell us what the, you know, that's how, that's what will be determined as we come through our process. But I see capital projects and environmental sustainability as being two of them. Yeah. Well, the cl council climate action goals, I think, have, you know, that, that to my, mm -hmm. my sense, of the green initiatives and mm -hmm. again that's the town council has done that and they can i would i would again ask they, they that they submit so that we can streamline the work and move forward what it is that they've done we have that that's, that's right. great right and yep. so then that can be, be incorporated i would mm -hmm. hope relatively with minimal effort simple however yes. i agree i think that um, and and the, 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 the capital projects are the most important thing in my mind that's omitted here, which is, but, but um, I agree that this is, it's, or no, it seems to me that there is an element of having it both ways. The CRC memo and the town council the planning board's job, we don't want to prescribe for you what you're doing. However, however, let's create lots of, and then, and let's create what this memo and its convolutions and it's, let's just start the work and, and, and present it and, 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 and proceed. We, I don't think that we need to um, vote on this as written that we've got the idea and we're moving forward and let's get to it. Well, I think we've moved on about taking a vote. What I'm looking for is specifics to give to CRC so they can rewrite this memo so we feel good about it. It is our work, it's our master plan, but let's look at the big picture here. Our goal is to approve something that can go to the town council and be adopted. I mean. You know, we have our basic job under the mass law, but now that we have a charter, we have like phase two. So that's what this memo is about. It's like you go do your phase one and then you give us an approved plan and we wanna be prepared and up to speed and 
here's our two cents about what we hope will come to us so we can adopt it. it, it this is phase two. So, Maria? So, I guess trying to be productive here for yeah. feedback. Um, I think steps four through eight are literally straight from the charter. That's what's a confusing portion, but we have to do those steps of like referring back and forth, but that's literally, someone mentioned like the chicken egg thing. Unfortunately, the charter was written at a time and there's stuff in the zoning, or, sorry, in the general bylaw that predated. So we have this weird back and forth from steps four through eight. So if you ignore yeah. that convoluted part, because we have to do those, the stuff before it is literally, it sounds to me like the CRC just wants to make sure town council isn't surprised by this final draft at the end and suddenly yeah. we're at a scramble. Yeah. I, as far as the details of how we communicate that from the CRC to town council, we're gonna work through that. We're, we've discussed this at zoning subcommittee. We're trying to figure out how do we even attack this? It's such a big, yet we're trying to make it a small task. So without getting into the weeds, um, I, like I think Chris, you said it best, CRC is a conduit. They're just communicating where we are to the town council so that it's not suddenly at the end, it's a mad scramble because they don't approve it and we have to go back to base one. Um, so, I mean, I do agree that there is some sort of um, gray sort of language in that paragraph you mentioned, Michael, and, and, I, and I think maybe it is because they didn't want to prescribe things to us, but maybe that was too strong of a word, it's saying, you know, town priorities, because that's assuming a lot, you know, like, like we've agreed on what those are. So, I mean, we could comment back that we don't want strong language like that, like something's been decided already. But otherwise, if we just look at this as a general outline that we're trying to make sure town council is kept up to date so they're not just at the end scrambling and then ignore the convoluted part from steps four through eight because it's literally yes. almost administrative. We have to have public hearings in front of people. We have to refer back and forth. So I, yeah, I'm curious what other parts are really confusing and maybe we can pick those out and send them back to the, C, uh, yeah, to the CRC as comments about what's wrong with this memo or what's confusing because I see it as a, just a rough outline. If they want us to approve it, or what are we doing? Vote to support. That sounds kind of vague, too. We're just supporting it. We're not like saying this is written in stone. We're just saying we support your eagerness to collaborate and to work together on this. What it is, we don't know yet. <laughs> we know we want to try to keep both sides informed. And yeah, this was kind of dumped on our lap that we are suddenly updating the master plan, but it sounds like it's a necessity, so it is what it is. I saw Jack's hand. Well, I just wanted to say that uh, I agree with Marie, and I think uh, Mike pointed out that verbiage in that particular paragraph is something that we can clearly comment on. Uh, you know, it's, that's a, it's a loaded one there and, and perhaps they can just spell it out. You know, it includes, uh, you know, the, the things you talked about, the green initiative and, and the uh, public uh, projects. Um, and then, and, you know, just make it uh, specific. Um, I think I saw Michael oh. and then <clears throat> you, Janet. I, I think since the by uh, state law, the master plan is the property of the planning board, uh, and by charter, we, the plan, the uh, town council has to approve the, pl the master plan. Adopt. Hmm? Adopt. Adopt. Sorry, adopt. Um, that we can, in good faith, um, make the master plan. We, we have been charged to uh, update the master plan. And I think simply deciding, as we just have, to go ahead and do that, uh, and communicating to the town council via the CRC <laughs> that we have a, under, are undertaking the challenge to update, to, to read, update the master plan, and we will submit it to the town council when we're finished with it. And that is, it seems to me, as according to the, the way the, the, the state law is written, that is our responsibility to do that. Uh, since the state law makes no reference to who should approve it or adopt it or uh, uh, whatever, 
after the 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 um, um, the, the uh, uh, planning board is done with it, um, we we I think can reasonably go ahead in good faith and do what the council wants us to do without getting bogged down in all the bureaucracy that the CRC has suggested we get involved in. And if the CRC feels, or the, the council feels, that they need to be consistently and continually updated about what the planning board is doing, uh, then they're perfectly willing to come to meetings and report to themselves, to, to the council, to each other, to make comments uh, as, as much as they want to, but to insert these other layers of bureaucracy into the process seems totally counterproductive and wasteful of everybody's time, and I don't think we should do it. Can I just ask what you're actually saying is too intrusive? What part? Well, the fact that we have to go back and forth, and, and there's the there is no back and forth. What are you, are you talking about? The later numbers? Yes. Well, that's in the charter. That came exactly from the charter. That's why it's like 45 days and then... Okay, so that's their problem. That's not our problem. Well, it's still our problem because we have to follow the charter. We have to follow the charter by producing a master plan, which we will do. But we're also a part of the town council. Like, they appoint our members that we're in that process well, then, right now. Well, we're then, looking for our seventh member, and we're looking to them to select our seventh member. Like, we are a branch of them. No, we're not a branch of them at all. Uh, we're, we're, they we're a separate um, body. Uh, the fact that they appoint us does not mean that we're a part of them. That's the whole separation of powers thing. You can't, you can't get into that. our work that we approve, and, and all the bylaws that we send, we send to them to approval. I mean, they, they're like our up, we, we're part of the process, we do good work, and then we send it up to town council. Whether it be bylaw changes, uh, roadway issues, um, you know, Chris could go on and on. We, most of our work, we have to send to town council to, for them to either actually approve it or in this case, adopt it. So of course we want to have an agreed process where they're going to, so we can update them so that they can feel ready to, you know, they've also, with the six month thing, they're saying they want it done timely. And I think what they're saying is in good faith and we're willing to do the work and stay updated as you work on it and not be cold and just have you deliver it to us and then you know, we're willing to get involved earlier to get it done quicker. I think that's all they're trying to do. And if you look at number three on page three in the middle, it says the chairs, meaning the planning board chair and the CRC chair, may determine that CRC members should be asked to attend meetings of the planning board or public hearings um, or the charter required working sessions. I, I think it's, it, this is vague speak. It's just saying like as the process rolls out, if it's determined that there needs to be more communication or less communication, then that will be determined. But as you do your good work, we just want to be kept up. And then we want an opportunity to give you our feedback before you actually approve it. I saw Maria's hand and then I'll go with you. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, I was looking down that way. Chris, can you correct me if I'm wrong? Are steps forth rate literally just falling steps in the chart? It's not like they made up this sort of back and forth where we have to have a public hearing and refer, you know, the four, those are literally, we have to follow those. I was in that meeting so I can clarify. Okay. Number four is, if you want to say, a little made up. But five and down is totally process. And why four got rewritten a couple times was because of this, we have this like, terrible way the charter was written, how they can give feedback, like they can propose changes when they go to adopt it, but we don't want that because we'll have already approved it. And then you get in this huge, awful cycle. So that was the part that was sort of created to go, okay, hey, I think that's more what they're trying to get town council to realize, okay, the charter says that, and then we've inserted this number four. This is where you get the opportunity to give your feedback and comment right before planning board is going to approve it so that we don't get in a cycle. 
So yes, um, sure. actually four and five are made up. So five. that whole thing. So I think that um, my concerns with four and five is sort of an yeah. idea of endless process that we submitted to CRC, we, they have 45 <laughs> days, that might be extended by the town council, then we get some feedback and then the council gets a report from CRC on the recommendations and the council deliberates to, and talks about and sending feedback. Like to me, I just, that looks like months, it could be months and months and months because the town council does not speak with one voice. And so those are my very specific turns. It's, that's not in the charter, that looks like a process that they'd like to engage in. But I, I was actually thinking like, I always like to fix problems. And so they want, the CRC and the town council want to be updated, counselors want to give feedback. One, one way to solve this would be have a master plan update website. And so as different sections are being considered, we can just stick it on the website, people can comment, you know, the public can comment, town councilors can comment. And so the update is always available and seen. And so they can keep themselves in the loop. And so maybe that's, maybe that's the easy way to get around three and four. I don't really feel at this point at 10, 23 at night that I, four and five look really like convoluted and kind of bureaucratic and I can see this thing going on forever because you know, you know, we, anyone on a committee can go on forever and discuss something. And I, you know, is the town council gonna come back with, do they have to decide amongst themselves what revisions they want and then agree on that? And that could take months. You know, just the website that's getting in the weeds of our process, and I think because that's not just for town council, but that could be totally as we finish chapters, we yes. put them up and have a comment board. But if you read number, it it says 45 days. Like this is not like a complex. It's very simple. It's no, no. But this, that's why they're trying to ask us. Like yeah. it shall accomplish this review within 45 days of the referral, and then. And, and the other critical thing, and this is what I'm counting on CRC and the town council members to be, is this is, if it's a complicated issue, then it's not going to be tackled in the update. We're going to be finding this already as we go through it. We're going to be like, okay, this looks simple. Oh, this is not simple. Put it in the basket. Like, as soon as it gets into complicated and big rewrites, but, it's, it's but not counsel, being done for now. Could look simple. At provisions that aren't being changed and disagree with them. They, they could, but that's for them to deal with and they have to get back within 45 days for us. We're not getting involved in their chat. That's, that's so I them. I think the timing question, I think four and five are creating problems with people, but I think, I think we all want to work together and collaborate. The, the charter says, send your revisions to us, which is what David keeps on saying is, where's the content? <laughs> like, if, you know, if you, if the town council during this process has very specific concern, definitely send it to us. We can do it. We can do it in real time, not at the end of the process. And we, if, but the, that, but that's they not were here. waiting for us to have our process. We're, we're talking about Yeah, in but a I'm just trying to say here. is that if you're, we this is my, determined but our, Christine, this is I'm just trying to give my, I'm that. trying to give my specific feedback to the I CRC think. that these four, two paragraphs seem convoluted. They okay. can go on forever. And I think they bother a lot of people. And your suggestion was to do more feedback along the road. Okay, we, that's a comment we can do. There's a hand raised on this side. Yeah, and I see one on this side too. So I was gonna yeah. say Jack, and then is it you? Okay, yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm kind of baffled because when you look at necessary and obvious, uh, it seems like almost editorial. And um, I, I just feel like we're, we're sweating a lot of details here, uh, making necessary and obvious changes to to this update. I mean, uh, to me, I could, you could almost give this to an editor, a technical editor somewhere, and, and they would get 95% of it done just <laughs> folding things yeah. in at probably, you know, $10,000. Uh, I, I don't understand. It's not a rewrite an update of necessary and obvious changes. And I guess I get, uh, you do mention, uh, as mentioned three and four could allow a lot of, you know, endless loop sort of thing. But again, go back to necessary and obvious. How are you gonna, you're gonna, you know, talk about whether that should be a semicolon uh, versus a comma sort of thing. I, I, it really shouldn't be that difficult. I mean, it really shouldn't, right? Necessary and obvious? Right, right. 
Yes. <laughs> and then David, I see Chris. Yeah. How about if we put off this decision about whether you want to adopt this plan or not, mm -hmm. and the next time you meet, I'll come back with my, you know, draft, very preliminary list of things that I think need to be changed in the master plan. And that might give us a sense of what the scope of this is, and maybe that would help to answer some of the questions about this. And I'm also thinking maybe you don't have to send comments back to CRC and town council. This is their document. Yes. They're offering it to you to see if you have any comments. You don't have to comment. You don't have to comment. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have to vote on it. So why don't we just well, stop talking about it for tonight, yes. and I'll send yeah. you at some point my rough list of things that I think very preliminary need to be changed, added, whatever, not inclusive at all, and that will help to make the conversation a little bit more on target, I guess is what I wanna say. Okay, and it would be helpful. I have a few recommendations that I've noted um, to have specifics, because um, I do think we need to give them um, feedback. Yes. Well, there, there's there's some question as to whether I mean on the on the on the on the board here. There's some question as to whether we do need to give them feedback. Um, as Brestrup suggested a minute ago, it was or maybe that wasn't the suggestion, but a, an idea that we don't respond to this in any particular way at all. That that it's their document and they can do what they will with it, and. Uh, that seems to me to be the best way to proceed. So I don't think the question of, of whether we will in fact uh, want to respond to this document has been settled. So I don't want you to think that it, it is accomplished. I guess as chair, I had two people come to us, the chair of the CRC and the assistant town manager, and the, they said they wanted our feedback on this. So I'm just trying to reply back to them on they brought us this memo they explained how it came about and their goals with it and they just want to move forward with it and go from CRC to town council and get town council to approve the process but the first thing the town council is going to say is well what does the planning board think of this and to have no comment just seems strange Maria? So for people who want to send comments, just to send comments. Do we have to act as one? No, right. I, I have a few that I would yeah. be willing to just, send forward. Yeah, can we just send some comments to you, Chris? Send your comments okay. To okay. You. okay. Yeah. Great. Whoever wants to. Great. Yeah. Okay. That's what we'll do. And when should we send them to you by? Ms. Pam can tell you when the CRC is planning to deliver this to Town Council, I forget the date. I want to say it's the 27th of January, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think it is. Um, I just want to say that the purpose of the memo... I'm sorry. I totally want you to speak, but you do have to come up to the... You know how it works. <laughs> okay. The green light is on. I believe, I mean, I was at several meetings. I didn't write the memo, uh, but I was at several meetings where we talked about it. The major purpose was to say that the CRC is a committee of the town council, which has been delegated by the town council to deal with these items, recognizes the supreme authority of the planning board. That was the emphasis. However, we do want to adopt it. And, and the, the difference between approve and adopt it. So the question was, how do you do that with the acknowledge that the planning board, this is their document? So it does get a little bit convoluted. Um, and one of the issues that I think she was dealing with was when do we have the public hearings or, because there's things in the charter and you know she knows that charter. So uh, there's a thing that we can't, and I don't know why, can't have a public hearing until after you have finalized the document. However, this memo says we could have some hearings. So the idea is you don't want to just pop it on the town council, but the town council doesn't want to pop it on the, on the public. 
So you want a smooth system. And the idea was a minor update of the necessary and obvious, not a big redoing of the plan, not something that should cause tremendous um, difficulty, take over all of your time, and cost a lot of money. And so it does get, I do admit, um, I read it for the third time in there, and when I came to that word, change priorities, I circled it, because that is an interesting sentence. I think that that, I don't think it meant anything big, but it could mean something big. So I think that that's something that you should comment on. Great. So it was, how do you, how does the town council adopt something without it going around and around forever? She was trying to cut the bureaucracy in a bureaucratic state memo, but um, to say that once you have, you, you write it, the planning board does it, it goes to CRC, who has been de deputized by the council to look at these things. They go over all of it, come up with some suggestions, go back to you, and then when you have the final document, your final document, it goes to town council. And they voted up or down. They don't vote. Well, I guess we do vote. We your vote to it. feedback and recommendation, like speaker, at that point, that's when the town council says they have issues with things, and it comes back to us before we take a final vote. Okay, I'm not sure about that. I have to, I, I think it did say at some point the town council just as, accepts it or doesn't accept it. That's and, after we've approved it. And yeah, where does after you've we, approved it. Yeah. They can't vote, town council can't vote until after the planning board has taken right. interesting feedback and has made whatever changes they decide to make. And where does the public meeting come in? But there's, there's this paragraph in there that says that we can't have a uh, hearing until after you, the planning board, have uh, voted it. But it then said, but we could have, the town council could have some forums. Isn't the point of a public hearing to possibly uh, make changes in the document well, that's being okay, considered? That's I would think, problem. but I will tell you, this is clearly written in terms of what the charter says. The charter has bad so. writing in it but they didn't realize this until they started to look into this. So this isn't how they want it. No. This is the way this it's is, written. That's it, just. David. I'd like to propose, in, uh, uh, consistent with my understanding of what Chris Restrup said, that we move on from this matter, okay. that, we, that, that there's been a lot of discussion here, okay. that including some feedback to the, for the CRC memo, and that there's other business that we have to address tonight. Um, and that we move on. Let's move on and we'll get you uh, comments by suggest. Friday. No, and thank you, Ms. Pam. Um, yeah, luckily hope there's not too much more we have to deal with here. So if we move to zoning subcommittee, item 7A, um, I'm pleased to announce that we took elections at Zoning Subcommittee, and Maria has been voted as the chair, and Janet is the vice chair. So I am turning to Maria to give a report. This will be short and sweet. Uh, we already discussed most of it because we spent most of the time discussing <laughs> what we were just discussing. Uh, although one person <laughs> did show up from Backyard ADUs, uh, literally his website is backyardadus.com and um, he has these great units that can go in backyards as accessory detached dwellings and they're like $200 a square foot and less. It's, you should look into it and um, I'm going to keep communicating with him and learn from him on lessons learned after you've built, built a few of them. How big are they? Um, between five and 700 square feet. So they're great infill sort of housing opportunities um, but otherwise yeah all we did was do what, exactly what we're just doing. So. Sounds like fun. <laughs> so, could I just add a little piece? I, I, I'm. So we just did. We did all that, and I, I and then, um, I. Really want to the zoning subcommittee. We've been doing hard work, and previous zoning subcommittees and planning boards have done work on um, zoning amends that we think are important, and I would love. And I was very disturbed after that meeting that we're not going to continue working on it and the council's not going to look at zoning. It looks like it could be a year. And so it'll be almost two or three years before we've had any zoning changes. And I don't understand the reason for that. And so I just want to highlight that as an issue and I'd like to talk about it more with the zoning subcommittee. But I, I really feel like 
there's things that we think are important and we can just move them up to the town council and they could sit there. Um, and we can continue the work that we do and work with, with Mr. Mora and things like that. But I just didn't want to just have all that work sidelined and we all sit there stagnantly. And that's why I'm suggesting. So that, that was a piece that I really was just to put it in people's heads, but not to discuss, right? Jack? Oh, that was Mike, actually. Oh. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say, I, I do like Janet's idea about um, not encumbering the, the zoning subcommittee with, with the master plan and, and having, the, you know, like ad hoc groups um, of us, you know, attacking different uh, chapters. But again, you know, this is. In crisis. You, you, you have yeah. been saying it. it uh, Chris is going to do mm -hmm. most of the heavy lifting. So then, you know, we, but we, I guess we want to help. We want to help. And I guess, we, you know, we just have to get some ed, uh, our initial comments to you. So that's, you know, the, the first step. I think we promised that to you anyway. So now you've decided you want to move ahead with it. So now I'm going to start moving ahead with my work. And I'll bring it to you as I have it ready. And we can talk about this again on the January 29th. Great. Uh, Michael? Two things. Now, uh, if, if, if Chris is going to start bringing us things, is the us the zoning subcommittee, or is the us the planning board, or is the us a new committee that we're going to create to uh, deal with this kind of, with, with this particular issue, as, as was suggested a minute ago? We're going into process again. Well, but if initially I could bring it to you, all of you, mm -hmm. and then when you feel overburdened by it and you want mm -hmm. to direct it to a subcommittee, you can create the subcommittee at that time. But you don't have to do it right now. Sounds good. Okay. Nice. And you had a second thing. I know what it was. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I also wanted to support uh, Janet's suggestion that we go right ahead with certain zoning bylaw amendments that we find are important. Uh, whether the council takes them up or not is their problem, not ours. If we think there's a zoning issue that needs to be addressed, like affordable housing or parking or whatever, whatever issue we think we want to address, that is addressed through a zoning change, zoning bylaw change. I think the zoning subcommittee should bring it forward to us, and we should act on it and forward it to the council, and they can do what they wish with it. Okay. Um, so, Chris, item seven, old business. Is there any old business? I don't think so. Um, I have an old business update. Really quickly, those yellow bollards in the parking lot of the Bank of America disappeared, and it was like completely sealed over. It was very, it was, it was exciting. As they should. I just looked at it, I was like, they're gone. So, mm. so our work has resulted in something. <laughs> Until it comes back again. <sighs> yeah. Um, uh, new business, item eight, uh, number A, Chris, that, that's the chapter 61A, withdrawal request, property of the, I don't even know how you say that, oh, Sala? So um, this topic is being discussed internally in town hall, and um, we plan to bring it back to you on January 29th. Well, what's Great. the discussion? Whether to purchase the, whether to exercise the right for well, I think that's always an option for the town to consider, so. Um, but, so, excuse me, it's a, if that's a town council decision, it's presented to the planning board, and what's the reason for that? Um, it's presented to both the planning board and the conservation commission, um, and the planning board can make a, a, a recommendation to town council as to whether you think the property is worth um, the town going after and trying to purchase it or not. And um, you base that on various criteria. So um, I can send, actually I should have sent this with the packet, which I didn't think about. Um, I will send you more information on chapter 61 and what the options are and why you might consider um, certain properties to be worthwhile to uh, acquire for the town. 
and then we'll have a better discussion about this on the 29th. Janet? Could we have information about the, the farmland and the quality of soils and all that kind of stuff? Is it some, some information about this? If we're going to make a recommendation, I'd like to know more about the farm itself. I can ask for that. Um, I can't have the, what should I say? I can't order to have the soils tested, but if there's material available, I will obtain it for you. Jack? Um, uh, confession here, I was involved for some of this all as a due diligence, uh, mostly in Hadley, though. But, yeah, so, so oh. the, the property has been reviewed and cleaned up. There were some, sol there were some solid waste issues there, but that was, that was about it. So that's just personal knowledge. Okay. <laughs> that's different from whether the soils are suitable for farming. Right. So that's a different question, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 yeah. You guys good for now? Yes. And then we'll come back? Okay. And no other questions? Okay. Um, so we can move to item B, timing of receipt of permit application materials. Do you want to do that tonight, Janet? No. <laughs> okay. So we'll move that no, to... Excuse me. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, I, I, this was, I had proposed. I, I'd like to propose that um, for consideration specifically that, that the planning board um, require materials that are scheduled for a meeting to be submitted prior to the publication of its agenda. So that's prior to Friday, the Friday before the Wednesday for a meeting. And then any material submitted after that, relating to that, we can, we can table or continue the, the, the meeting at our discretion. I, I'd like that concrete proposal for our consideration whenever we get to it. We, so, we, but do they get sent to us and then we decide or? Well, well for example, no, for example, today with the uh, Main Street, that, that modification to the site plan review that we had approved in August. We received the development application report, which is significant. We received that yesterday by email. I did not have time between yesterday and tonight to read that in this material. And so they can present, the applicant can present what they want to, but we, we should not be pressured. We should, be, you know, to, to render a decision when there has been material that has not been included in our packet. And that I think that we should responsibly set a deadline and notify the public, notify potential applicants. And you know, if there's once a hearing is scheduled, if material is submitted after such and such a date prior to that hearing, you know, they may or may not be considered and, and, and will continue the hearing. Are you talking about the development application report? That was, the, that was the example. That's what that came, because that's an internal, so we have to be clear whether we're just talking about submitted materials from the applicant or stuff that's coming from in-house from Ms. Bestrop. So I have to apologize that that yes. came so late. I've been very, very busy lately, and I just didn't have time to do it. But I, I understand your point, and at any time, I, f I feel, uh, uh, what should I say, obligated to send you materials as they become available. You can make a decision that we received this document too late. I haven't had time to read it. I can't vote on this tonight. That's a perfectly legitimate thing to say at the public hearing. And I, I don't have any problem with that. But I feel like if I've completed a report and it pertains to something that you're going to be talking about that night, I have an obligation to send it to you. And again, you have perfect right to say, no, I haven't had time to read it. So <laughs> I guess that's my, well, that's my uh, response. Uh, and, so, and so perhaps the, so the, the application report, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of that 60-page memo we received from Bacon Wilson the day before or the day of uh, one of the Amherst Hill hearings. That happens almost every meeting. Whether they're, who produces, whether it's internal or external, I don't honestly know all of that, but, but, but um, I think that we, a standing rule that materials not submitted in a timely fashion 
shouldn't should not pressure the planning board, and I feel like that that that's the current state. Um, I I don't want to be the gatekeeper. I don't want to be the person who says this thing came in too late. I am not going to give it to the planning board because it came in on Friday instead of Thursday. Because I think that's your decision to make. This thing came in too late. We can't consider it tonight. Because there may be something that I don't know that you think is really important that you need to have for that meeting. And I don't want to be the person making that decision. It also puts you in a weird place, like I think of emails that shoot in that last day. Like, we hate getting them, but you read them and you know, and then, she, like, then we don't know. I don't know. I hate feeling rushed, but yet I still want to have the information and then make the choice whether or not I, like, there is the point, always say, I didn't have time to read this. I mean, we can even take time out, or it just doesn't go. Like, I knew this stuff that came in. I knew this wasn't really going to move tonight, like, in a, a vote. So I knew everybody would still have time to read it before we actually have to vote. But you have a good point about, like, application stuff. Like, the certain stuff clients, like, when we ask, like, tonight, we said we need stuff from them, right? Well, and we always say, okay, and now we're pushing you to February 5th. Well, it should be clear that actually that stuff shouldn't be coming to us on the 5th. There should be a rule, and it's very clear that we expect it to be there by, you know, Friday at 5 o'clock or something. So, I guess my motion, so. so, exactly. So, I'm a little, <laughs> David, I know you jumped in and we're doing it. Janet had already come and told me that she had an actual motion she wanted to do. Um, so, I'm going to let her do her motion too, and then. Maybe we won't take action on it. Maybe we yeah. will, but I think we need to think about this. And, and Chris, too, maybe you can think of where the line can be drawn. Um, go ahead, Janet. So, so David, you, make, you talked about this uh, months ago, I get this at the point. And so I actually did a motion and I, because I was thinking about this problem in terms of the timing. And I was, my motion is I move that the planning board add a rule to its regulations that applicants for permits must submit all materials nine days before the scheduled hearing date. If the materials are submitted later, the applicants will be required or urged to agree to continue the hearing to the next available date. So this is like the Monday, and it's not, it's not a week earlier, it's nine, it's the Monday. So that would give the planning department two or three days to pull your packet together, to write your report. Um, it doesn't say that, you know, the fire chief's report can't come in at the last minute, but you know, it's, there's so many reasons, it, you know, people are coming to us for permits, they want them. They should get their applications together, they should get them in, in time, in a way that the planning department can get it in a regular way, they can conduct their lives and other priorities. Um, I, don't, I think, you know, lawyers are used to these kind of deadlines all the time, and I think we need to push it back. And I would, you know, if, if the app, if we got our packet sent out on Wednesday, that, you know, I could, you know, either deliver it or we'd have like a week to look at stuff, and we wouldn't have this barrage of emails coming in and information, because I can't think about it and digest stuff and put it all together without time. And I, I think that um, maybe we could try that for six months and see if we can get better practice in the community and for ourselves and less chaos. I also think we'll spend less time at hearings and have fewer hearings if we have more materials earlier and more complete applications, because we always ask for more stuff. But we don't have to get it, you know, weeks and weeks, you know, at the last minute. So. I'll second that motion. Discussion? Can you send me that right, uh, in what, writing? Me? Uh, what's the Conservation Commission? I know that they, they have more uh, uh, strict uh, submittal guidelines. And do you, anybody know what those are? No, but I can find out. I, I, I would think we'd want to parallel that. I, I agree, and, yeah. and I just, um, I think Janet said nine days. I just wanted to ask Chris, is how do you think that's too far out? Would that even work? So if we meet on Wednesdays, it's like a week and a half before. I, I think it is too far out, and I think it's very, um, the whole process is very fluid and very flexible, and Sometimes when someone really wants to get something done quickly, like Mr. Robleski tonight, he absolutely begged to be able to have his public hearing on January 15th. That was very important to him. 
I don't know what his reasons for that were, but we pushed to have the hearing on January 15th. He didn't submit his material until December 20th. So, you know, that was only like three weeks that we had, and it was Christmas time and New Year's in, in between. Um, so, we didn't have time to examine the application, talk to Mr. Mora, think carefully about whether the special permit was needed or not. There's a lot of communication that goes on. You know, ideally we have at least a month between the time of submission and the time of the planning board public hearing. But even so, we have a long list of other things that we're working on that have nothing to do with the planning board that we have to fit the planning board in with all these other things. So we try to do things as much, um, as quickly as we can and fit it into whatever else we're doing. You're prioritizing so, many layers. Yes, you could say that. So having a strict rule of having everything submitted nine days in advance, that... No, but it sounds like they submit most of their information even further back than nine days, but the clog sometimes happens in the actual planning department. Yes, that's correct. Because yes. they have to analyze it, run it by other people, and before it even gets to us, they're already finding things that need to be done, more information, fixing things on forms, and then Chris starts writing reports for it to go to us. Um, so in this case, if yeah. we had said, you know, planning department, you have to have your report in nine days in advance. That would be when? Last, Last Monday. Monday. Yeah. So this public hearing could it, have occurred. It's, it's not you for... You just wouldn't have had your analysis by the planning department in front of you when you heard the material. Now, in the end, it turned out you're going to continue, so you'll have yeah. plenty of time to read it. But um, it's just kind of the way we operate is not... Um, Maybe it should be, rigidly according to a clock and a time s schedule, and we can try that, but I'm thinking it's really going to be hard to make it work. So it wasn't for the planning department nine days before. It was the applicants to get all their materials in nine days before the hearing. I'm trying to clear space for you guys, too. Does that work? We could try that, but sometimes we find that um, through our analysis, oh, they didn't submit their management plan. So we call right, them up and say, hey, right. you didn't submit your management plan. Get it in by the time we send the packets out or whatever. And they do that. And so you have the management plan when you have your public hearing. So it helps to streamline things. So I'm willing to try this, but I think it's going to be challenging to make it work. Michael. These are, these are big deal developers, mostly. Uh, aren't, aren't, shouldn't they be responsible for knowing what the rules are and that they, that they need to get their, their plan in before a certain time. Um, I, I, you know, I understand that part of your job is to make it possible for these things to happen. On the other hand, um, the developer needs to take a certain amount of responsibility for following the timelines that are established, the procedures that are established, as long as they're clearly established. And it seems to me that this is an opportunity to clearly establish a timeline which any reasonable developer ought to be able to follow if he or she is paying attention. Let me ask this. Are you uh, proposing to put this in your rules and regs? Or are you just proposing to vote for it tonight and try to make it work? I, 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 was, I was proposing it as a change to the rules and regs, but I think that um, I don't think we're ready to vote on it tonight. I think we want to think about it more. I'd love to think about it when I have more some sleep. I'm glad you said that because I was going to say I'm not comfortable with voting on this right now because my main concern is, yeah, our own comfortableness and getting the information in a timely and adequate manner, but I don't want to put a burden on Ms. Bestrup. She's got enough on her plate right now. I think that's why we're here at 11 o'clock at night. And what I'm hearing is they submit their information and then it's, it's, it's in there, and you're grinding it out as fast as you can, balancing many things, and coming back to the developers and saying, oh, and we need this, and we need this. You need to change this. I just talked to Rob Moore. You need this. And it's just going to be a burden on her because she's going to be panicked. My God, I have to ask them for more stuff, and I'm past the nine days, and then she's just going to be stressed that she's failing us. So can, that's why can I you feel reschedule like the hearing? It needs to be to you to say, hey, we didn't get this till yesterday, or we just got this at the public hearing. We can't 
deal with this now. We, we haven't had a time to think about it. So that's what I would prefer, is that the planning board said I clearly, I need this in more in advance so I can read it over the weekend or whatever it is you have, um, and not have, it, not have us be the gatekeepers, because there are times when things absolutely need to get to you immediately. My conversation with Joel Bard this afternoon, you know, that was, that was a new thing. Um, so there's always stuff coming in at the last minute. So. so how about we think about it, but especially you, Chris, in your quiet moments, we're looking for things that help you. I think that's where this is coming from with David and Janet. Like, yeah, we're trying to help ourselves, but we want to help you. And if you can come up with something that would streamline this to make it better for you and, and Pam and the rest of your department, then we'd love to hear it. Um, does that sound okay for tonight, everybody? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, Jack. <clears throat> uh, I have to go back to the Saul's uh, thing. Oh, I, did not, I did not look at that property. It's on the wrong side in 116. I just want to say I know nothing about oh, it. Oh, so we can be right. dirty as hell. You don't know. All right. Thank you. Good clarification. It could be a uh, super fun site. He did. True <laughs> Good, okay, clarify, yep, okay, great, thank you. Um, and we, I think, handled item eight, uh, number C. Chris, I think we're all set with the schedule for now. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, topics not anticipated, is there any other new business? Okay, great. Uh, number nine, Form A, A&R, subdivision applications. Yes, we do have a Form oh, A. Oh, God! I don't think it's complicated, and I think okay, you good. sort of know all about it already. And if I'm lucky, Pam has created a nice little map here. So pass around, or we'll pass around the map. I will explain it, and Pam will take around the big map. Janet? So this is the property that you may have read about in the newspaper. It's on the corner of University Drive and, one, and Route 9. It's right opposite oh, yeah, yeah. the... Um, Chinese restaurant, and it is, um, it had uh, been yeah. formerly talked about for a Walgreens. Anyway, um, Barry Roberts is interested in creating a mixed use building on that corner, and um, there are, I think there are three properties, or four properties there. So he wants to combine. I see four. He yeah. wants to combine three of the Makes properties oh. into one property. Um, okay. Currently, there's a brick ranch style house on that property and so you know, it was used as a you know single family house and now he has a proposal to do something else with the property but this a and r plan that you're looking at tonight is the proposal to combine the three properties that are in the prp zoning district prp okay This project is coming before the Zoning Board of Appeals on January 23rd. So he's proposing, I'm sorry, a mixed-use building? Oh, mixed-use building. I think there are 72 uh, dwelling units and an office for, I understand it's going to be Hold a doctor's up, yeah. office um, on the ground floor. So you said three. I see three and a chunk of the fourth. Trump, Maybe a little piece of the itself. fourth that's, yes, uh, like uh, no, this, this triangle? The yeah. end of the it's, little it's cut off wedge. The yeah, so it's three lots and, like I'm saying, a piece yeah. of the fourth. That's a, yeah. So it impacts all four, and the fourth piece shrinks. Yeah. That's yeah. The, and it's at the dead end. Oh, there must be an easement through it, too. Is there an easement through the, the fourth lot? Just wondering. That's why they're probably not using it. Yeah, I was wondering. It was supposed to be a road that went through south. Bypass, yes. Right. A million. It's going to connect to, they call it the southeast bypass, or something like that. Yeah, it's going to connect to 116. It's going to connect to 116. Right. It never went through. I was just wondering, because if there was an easement, that's one of the reasons why they may not be utilizing that lot, because... Oh. There's an easement. You mean the one on the right? You know, like, yeah, like. It's a different zoning district. Oh, it's it, RN, I believe. And the good. others. Uh, okay. So this becomes PRP then? What happens with I think this that little. Is PRP now. 
Well, that's that's the little triangle piece yeah. that's part of the art. So the line just cuts. The line it's a lot in two zones. Okay, great. Anyone have any other questions? So, Looks pretty so yes, you do. I think that this is another project that is looking for a waiver of the parking requirement, and there's going to be a t you know like tons of small apartments you know fitting. You know, so I that's just, I, so I think this issue is going to keep coming up as the waivers mm -hmm. are granted and that pushes the need for the zoning Which will help us by law change. Give us examples of how these other buildings are working, yeah. like university. But that has no, it has no options for where people park if it were Well, so far, university, I've been checking, it's working. Yeah. Well, so, but that will build our, our information. Okay, so do they have to vote to, or do Would we just say, say okay? Would you say that you're authorizing Ms. Gray Mullen to sign this so A&R plan? Yes. Okay, great. Um, uh, ZBA applications, is that you, Pam? I don't think we have told you about, um, there's a request for a special permit for the use of a recreational marijuana retailer. Uh, it's going to be located at 328 College Street. And the name of them is RC Retail Amherst LLC. So that's going to go in front of the zoning board um, on February 13th. All right, thanks. It's w pretty it's, far down. It's um, by Spirit House. It's just yeah. across the driveway from Spirit House. In that long strip mall. It's on the end, I think, isn't it, of the strip mall. Um, number 11, SPP, SPR, sub-applications. Okay. Okay, um, so section 12 is the committees. Does anyone have anything vital they need to report? Nope. Uh, Michael has I'm, one. I'm sorry. Um, no, go ahead. Just briefly, no, the, no, the, that's why the uh, CRC has started its um, deliberations for this this round. Uh, the largest of which is a request for a um, million and a half dollars from uh, the library for historic for preservation of the uh, historic records that it, it contains. Oh, archive. Did you mean archives. CPA? Yeah, yeah. Hmm? Did you mean CPA? Yeah, you said what did CRC. I, say? I think you said CRC. I'm sorry. It's Acronyms. late, yes, so yes, we're yes, yes, speaking yes. in vegetables. CPAC. Here, so, yeah. Um, so that's that's one thing. The other thing that's of interest to us on the planning, on the planning board is um, the notion that the rather than uh, rather than the um, uh, CPAC allocating monies specifically for individual housing, pro affordable housing projects, that there become, that becomes a, an allocation directly to the housing trust. Uh, so that therefore that organization can respond more quickly to um, individual needs as they, as they might come up in between uh, rounds of um, uh, CPAC uh, uh, evaluations. Uh, we haven't decided on that. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's a good idea or not. And if anybody has any particular interest in that issue, uh, I'd be glad to hear it um, so that I can convey that information. Uh, there's, it seems to me there's um, reasonable uh, arguments on both sides of that issue. Um, and I don't want to go through them now because it's 11 o'clock. But uh, if anybody wants to know more about that, let me know. May I go back to the ZBA for a minute? Sure. We know we're, <laughs> we're reasonably sure that Valley CDC is going to submit their um, comprehensive permit CDC. proposal. Actually, back up. They're going to submit a letter to the state for a letter of eligibility on the, what do they call it, enhanced SRO or supportive housing project on Northampton Road. We think that's going to happen before the end of January, so that means they'll be coming to the Zoning Board of Appeals sometime in the spring. But I wanted to bring you up to date on that. Can you repeat the amount for CPAC for the library? 1.5. Yeah, it's it presumably it'll be an amount that would be bonded over the over a ten or maybe five or ten year period. At, it's 1.5 for what? For for archival? It, it go it goes to the basic building fund, but it's earmarked for specifically for 
uh, creation of an archival room and reasonable uh, equipment for that room. Uh, it's based on a percentage of the total cost. They decided that I think it was 10.28% of the building, new building proposal was devoted to, to the archives. And that money is 10.2% of the total cost of the, of the town's contribution to the building. Does that make sense? Kind of. Okay. Yeah, that's great. They need it badly. If you've ever been up there, I'm up there a lot, and it's not good. All right, so that's wonderful. Um, any other? Um, okay, see none. Uh, report of chair, none. Report of staff, none. We've reported enough. Adjournment, do I hear a motion? Uh, end. We are ending at 11.07. Is that really a record? I I'm like, how is this possible? Thank you, Amherst Media, if you're alive back there.